Hello, good morning everybody. So for those of you outside, please try and come inside quickly. Um, I have just one piece of announcement to make. Um, a few of you have asked us to do attendance certificates. So if, if you have not expressed your interest and you want to, please see me at some point this morning because then we will we'll have to print them from the MRC and bring them over here. And unfortunately, I think he's running late. So I've been asked you know, to step in for him. So this morning, we have uh, the pleasure of having Dr. Robert Zogmore, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who is going to talk to us this morning. He's about food security. Yeah, he's uh, one of our renowned African scientists. He's an agronomist by agronomist and soil scientist with a PhD in production ecology and uh, resource conservation from University of Wageningen in Netherlands. Before joining the CCAFS, he was a senior staff within the environmental program of the Sahara and Sahel Observatory Tunisia, where he was actively involved in the implementation of initiatives uh, 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 initiatives uh, pertaining to uh, pertaining to one desertification, land degradation, and drought. Uh, in addition uh, to climate change adaptation in Africa, and uh, this has made him very qualified for us to talk to us. Uh, he has also been involved. He also coordinated a joint funded IDRC DFID program entitled Experimental Capacity Development Approach and a Toolkit for Monitoring and Evaluation within the Climatic Change Adaptation Initiative in collaboration with UNICA, AgriMet, and IUNCF. Prior to that, he spent one year at a post, as a postdoc at Japan International Research Center for Agricultural Science. Kelly has a wealth of uh, experience. From 1990 to 2007, he was a senior researcher and has been a chief department of the Natural Resources Management and Farming Systems at the Institute of Environment and Agricultural Research at Burkina Faso. Uh, thanks to his great experience in integrated land and water management at plot and water set skills, he has contributed developing adaptation options and strategies to climate variability and land degradation in vulnerable and semi-arid ecosystem. And he was also, he taught at the, as a part-time lecturer at the Polytechnic University of Bobo Jolasso on land degradation and sustainable land and water management. He has published widely with more than 50 papers and books books, chapters on soil erosion, integrated soil, water, and nutrient management options. So please welcome uh, me to ask Dr. Zongumori to give his lecture. Dr. Zongumori, please.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank uh, all the organizers who invited me to uh, this important uh, conference. Um, I've decided to focus my talk on uh, food and nutrition security and the environmental change in Africa, and mainly focusing on the nutrition and equity issues, which I think can be also the, the area where we can see a link between kind of food system research and the health system uh, uh, research. So this is the outline of my talk. A lot has been said about climate change impact uh, in Africa, but I think this slide is really talking clearly about what is happening now. In terms of temperature, as, as you can see, uh, during the last 100 years, we can see the high temperature raise around 2000. And this is a fact uh, to convince those who still don't believe that climate change exists, that something is happening at least. But more importantly, uh, uh, when we look at IPCC recent report on global warming, it's clear, it's, we have only 10 years now to act if we want to prevent uh, from exceeding the 1.5 degrees Celsius as defined by the Paris Agreement. So action is needed. And I think yesterday, uh, some participants were also asking the question, how can we move forward from the research to action? I will come later on those aspects. And the other fact I wanted to mention is that for specifically for the African continent, we can also see that uh, projected temperature increases are higher than the global increase, which again for, uh, highlight the fact that although Africa is not uh, um, a key emitter of greenhouse gas emission, we are impacted severely compared to those who emit. Now, again, in terms of precipitation, I will go a bit quicker because uh, we already know those things. But just to give, give some few figures, uh, IPCC again predict that the Guinea coast and the Central Africa will see the length of wet spill, spell uh, decreasing with an increase in the heavy rainfall. So climate extreme will become more and more prominent in this region. For the Western Sahel, strongest drying with significant increase in length of the, the dry spell. So climate variability will become again more and more impacting on all the food system. The Greater Horn of Africa, same uh, problems. The Mediterranean region, strong increases in dryness and reduced water availability. So even the underground water will be impacted by climate change. And this is a key resource, even if you want to use it um, as a source of irrigation for, for production. And again, this is uh, a result, one of the results of a recent paper that CCAF has produced with uh, University of Leeds, showing clearly the area of crop with reduced rainfall. And we see, for instance, for these major staple crop, rice, maize, soy, and wheat, that the reduction will be substantial. And this has consequences in terms of food system globally, but also for uh, uh, most developing countries. So I won't bother you with uh, all these projections, but just to give you a figure for West Africa uh, uh, about climate hazard here, about uh, high variability, uh, uh, for, for, for different countries and regions. Uh, here it is about current flood risk in West Africa. So it gives you an idea. Um, 
and here it is about current drought risk in West Africa. Just to say that, yes, we say data is an issue, but still some models help to have some kind of trends that can be used to inform policy decision making. Of course, taking into consideration uh, the probabilistic nature of all these uh, projections as well. And here again, when we look at the projected changes in above ground net primary production, um, uh, we look at, for instance, the Gambia case, we see that from the figure uh, of the period 71 to 80, there is a serious drop uh, uh, that is expected by 20, 2050, showing that definitely the total biomass production will be reduced. And this will have some serious consequences in terms of uh, food production. Coming to agriculture, if I have one single graph to express the impact of climate change on agriculture, it will be that one. And uh, in fact, this is a result of uh, a projection by 2090 taking 18 climate models and using the current scenario uh, defined by the IPCC, which is uh, the prominent one as far as we are concerned. And in fact, it shows that uh, more than 20%, huge areas will see, huge, uh, will see uh, more than 20% reduction in the length of the growing season. And vast areas uh, uh, will uh, will see ag uh, again about five to twenty percent reduction in the length of growing period for major crops like rice, meat, sorghum, uh, millet, and so on. Almost nothing in terms of increase of the length of the growing season, apart from you know these. Uh, green dots you see in the eastern part of Africa, uh, which are increasing uh, length of the rainy season, showing that uh, apart from the adverse effect of climate change, there may also exist some opportunities. And we scientists, we have to take that into account because we may use these kind of opportunities to offset the, the ad adverse effect of climate change. So this clearly shows that if something is not done, uh, and if we continue with the current scenario, we may be facing serious food security issues. As you can see here in this graph, you can compare Africa uh, to the rest of the world. Eh? We see that the need for food is just drastically increasing as a consequence, of course, of the increased population, but also because of climate change. Now, let me touch base a bit about uh, agriculture uh, consideration within the national determined contribution. I think it's something important to, to highlight because we've analyzed uh, the how countries consider the sector of agriculture within the NDCs. And the, the sector is expected to reduce methane emission, especially from uh, livestock sector, and N2O emission by one gigaton per year by 2030 to stay within the two degree limits uh, of the agreement. And we realize that more than 85% African countries have prioritized agriculture and land use sector within their indices. We know that African countries usually prioritize adaptation, but here it's about greenhouse gas mitigation, and 85% countries have committed to that. So it means there is action to be taken to help the countries to be able to define a sound solution in terms of a mitigation option, which is still, I think, uh, a, a big challenge for most countries. Now let me shift to the 
uh, nutrition component of things. We observe that increasingly uh, there is a transition in the, in the nutrition system due to wealthy and urbanized consumer becoming more and more the kind of key drivers of that. And if you look at the graph uh, on the downside, we see indeed that there is an increase in the number of people uh, uh, who are becoming, um, uh, who have migrating towards urban region, urban areas. And this will be a key driver of change of diet and, and some of the food system. Also important uh, is that we have to take into consideration where we are coming from in terms of research on nutrition. And I just uh, realized that here, uh, the discovery of vitamin has led to supplement and food fortification approaches. Uh, and this is just recent, so I'm highlighting this to draw our attention about the lack of sufficient research around these areas. We still need to work a lot to, to support uh, policies, strategies regarding uh, food system and especially nutrition. And here again, I'm giving some few uh, uh, figures as stated by the Global Nutrition Report in, in 2018. This is the figure for uh, children uh, affected by stunting and overweight. This is the global prevalence of obesity among adults aged 18 years and over, still by the same report. And this is a figure for malnutrition in multiple form. Uh, and here I want to highlight the fact that for overweight, uh, anemia, and stunting, uh, there are 41 countries that have been seriously affected. And out of these uh, uh, 41 countries, 30 are from Africa. So again, it called for uh, more intensive research on that matter in order to really have uh, some specific figures regarding these different components. And again, malnutrition is in multiple form, as you can, uh, you can see here. Uh, unfortunately, West Africa, again, uh, is, uh, is facing um, both overweight, anemia, and stunting, all together, all the three together. Uh, apart from um, maybe Burkina Faso, who has just uh, two elements of it. So why such poor level of, of nutrition? Uh, probably overwhelming majority of farmers in sub-Saharan Africa are net buyers of food. And this is something we can observe here in, in the Gambia, in Senegal, right, we still ex ex import rice. And everything almost that we are consuming is, is, is bought from, from elsewhere. So this is an important fact. Big proportion of income are spent on food, as I said, but also the relative prices of healthier food are high compared to staple grain, which doesn't encourage the most vulnerable of the poor one to be able to afford uh, high quality uh, food. I also draw this, uh, this graph from a publication by Peltzer and, and, and Pengrit, which really show and highlight the inadequate fruit and vegetable consumption for adolescents, uh, meaning from 13 to 15 years old boys and girls. And it was observed that fruit consumption uh, is associated with various factors such as, for instance, growing without food, uh, education, gender, uh, ethnicity, etc. And for vegetable consumption, uh, the main factors are, for instance, the lack of caregiver supervision and, and the same factors that are mentioned for, for the fruit consumption. 
and this shows the complexity of really undertaking research for, for nutrition. Again, calling for very specific studies uh, if we want to have uh, evidence-based policy decision-making. What about agriculture and nutrition linkages? Again, I refer to a, a recent study uh, showing that increasing amount of evidence on nutrition-sensitive programming is very, very important in terms of uh, uh, affecting and inducing a shift in the way people are uh, nourish, nourishing themselves. And also, we found that agricultural diversity has a small but cons consistent positive association with more diverse diet. And I believe this is one reason why, for instance, uh, the, in West Africa, the ROPA, which is the, the West Africa Farmers Organization, is really, really pushing for uh, what they call family farming, through which they will keep the diversification uh, of cropping uh, at, the, at the household level. This will really help to keep some of the nutrients that are lost through the monoculture uh, options. And again, um, there are some pathways that have been already drawn by previous studies to show how agriculture can impact nutrition. And uh, I've listed some of them. You can see them, food access uh, from own production, income from sale of production, food prices, and so on and so forth. These are the kind of areas, I think, where if you want to conduct research, we have to look at more specifically on these kind of pathways. And of course, it has a good component in gender, which is uh, already a good thing. So climate change uh, definitely uh, will impact uh, the nutrient-dense crop. And this will have some adverse effect, again, on uh, the, the increases in person diseases and decreases in pollinators. So again, we expect that there will be increasing level of carbon dioxide uh, due to climate change, and this will again affect the nutrient composition of crops. So uh, this call again for specific studies, research, in order to have the best figure possible that will help uh, to move the agenda of, of nutrition. Now, I've borrowed a few slides from my colleague uh, Phil Tonton uh, on how climate change interacts with inequity to impact nutrition. As you can see, this call for a kind of high-level uh, interdisciplinary work, as you can see the different logo on the downside of it, because climate change will impact uh, people, uh, not only because of where they live, but also because of who they are, because they grew, for instance, up, they grew up in poverty, or because of their gender, caste, ethnicity, age, and so on. So these are the key factors that really uh, worsen, I would say, the, the the vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis food system and nutrition of, uh, uh, of, of people. This is really an interesting study, and I, will, I invite people to look at it. Um, uh, and for instance, in terms of finding of, of, of research conducted on this area, uh, we see here, for instance, that Sub-Saharan Africa is the region where a lot of studies have been conducted and uh, uh, mainly uh, undernutrition was the focus area uh, followed by uh, uh, micronutrient deficiency. So it's a good thing that we can see at least that for, for Sub-Saharan Africa, there are some few studies, but we still need uh, a lot uh, to fill the gap. And here again, it's about the equity categories that have been reported so far. Um, it's a result from literature review. And we see here that the most reported are the place of residence, the socioeconomic status of stakeholders, 
the occupation and livelihood, and the personal characteristic of people that uh, have, have been really uh, uh, studied in terms of equity theme. And finally, uh, regarding this study, uh, I wanted to also highlight the fact that some dimension of equity, such as fairness, meaning how disrupted agricultural productivity can affect uh, uh, greater on poor groups, greatest uh, uh, still on those with, with poor market access. So all these people are greatly affected. Justice, justice, for instance, taking into consideration gender or patriarchy, assumption about how women uh, in, uh, interact, work, uh, caring practices, and more importantly, inclusion. Inclusion is important because we cannot work for people and we don't associate them in the research. And so the participatory planning of, of our work should strongly involve uh, this vulnerable group uh, in order to find the best climate adaptation option. And in that sense, I just want to give the example of uh, the inclusion of women group in our work in the Climate Smart Villages in Senegal, uh, through which uh, we, we work in a collaborative manner with communities in the village and women have formed a separate group to be able to define what are the most important things for them. We capacitate them to initiate activities of interest. And through these activities, for instance, they decided to transform, to process baobab fruit into powder so that they can use it uh, both for selling, for, to generate income, but also to produce some cakes that they use to, uh, to they, they, that the kids are really, really uh, lacking, uh, liking very much. And it has some implication for, definitely for nutrition. Nowadays, I can tell you in this village, there is a partner who is ready to help the women group to create a micro enterprise so that they can respect the standard for producing the baobab uh, powder and it can be exported even outside uh, Senegal. So generating a lot of income for these very brave women. So in terms of key messages, uh, I would say that low and middle income countries are experiencing a nutrition transition, as I said it. Agricultural development does not lead to automatic improvement in nutrition status. But nutrition sensitive programming can have a positive impact. Climate change will have major impact on nutrition in a number of ways, but less attention is given to how exclusion perpetuates inequity, as I mentioned before. So we believe that we really need to transform our food system. Uh, especially under climate change. And I want to mention that there is a new global initiative uh, that has gathered more than 100 partners globally, and, and they would like to really focus on these four areas uh, that I mentioned here in order to really undertake a, a huge transformation of food system, rooting, de-risking, reducing, and realigning. And as an example, to finish my talk, this is one concrete example of how we can transform food system. It's an example case in Senegal, where CCAF has worked uh, with, part, with, with, with communities to help them uh, manage better the climatic risk during the rainy season of three months. How? So we partnered with a, a national med agency in Senegal in order to develop a very effective and downscale, downscale climate information services that can help farmers, for instance, before the season to be able to decide what to crop, when to plant, where to plant, depending on the seasonal forecast. And during the season, 
we provide other climate information services that help them to decide when to use fertilizers, I mean to apply fertilizers. So if, for instance, uh, the forecast says that in two days' time there will be a rainfall, they can decide not to apply the fertilizer before the two days to avoid the washing of the fertilizer or weeding. And during the, at the end of the rainy season, we provide information allowing them to decide about when to harvest. We know how many farmers are losing huge part of the, the harvest at the end of the rainy season just because of the unexpected uh, uh, rain event that comes and creates new diseases and other uh, pests. So do, in doing so, we have been able to help them uh, to develop uh, practices uh, in the Climate Smart Villages that go hand to hand with the Climate Information Services. And to scale up this approach, we partner with the Union of Rural Community Radios, which uh, comprises more than 100 rural radio uh, across uh, Senegal. We capacitated these radio communities and journalists to understand the jargon of climate change, to understand exactly what means the weather and climate information services, and to produce broadcast program on the information in the local language of their place. So making it easy for communities to adopt and to understand what should be done. And in that sense, we have been able to potentially reach 7 million farmers in Senegal. At a level that nowadays the government of Senegal has decided to consider climate information services as an agricultural input at the same level as fertilizers, seeds, mechanization, and whatever. So just to show that there are actions that may already help to get some substantial outcome at the farmer level, and of course to influence uh, the food system. So I want to stop here. Uh, I could have given more examples of, of this type, but uh, I think this example just show that things are happening in the ground and we have to pursue on that sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zongobori. I think since you are running late, we'll just uh, ask for one or two comments or questions. State your name, please, and uh, where you are. Thank you. Uh, Andy Haynes, well, thanks for a fantastic talk, really, and we learned a lot from it. Um, we can have a lot of questions, but let me ask you just one question. It's really about the health of the soil. And we know that many parts of Africa, soil is being degraded, there's desertification happening and so on. Uh, and we know that has very important implications for human health as well as for the health of the wider environment. And the soil, of course, is a very important store of carbon. So as we degrade soil, we reduce the capacity to take up carbon. What are the uh, effective strategies, really, for protecting soil and preserving the, the health of the soil so we can continue to, to grow crops and, and resist climate change? Thank you. This is really an important question. And I will just take the case of aflatoxin, uh, which is, I mean, coming from the soil and, and is affecting, for instance, groundnut maize. And Ecrisatis has been working hardly with IITA to find some solutions. I guess, as I said, uh, if we don't shift our way of doing research in order to involve you guys who are really involved in the health sector to come in and, and, and work collaboratively, we will solve the, the piece of the, the issue, but not the whole issue. So I think it's an important point that uh, we should consider in terms of promoting interdisciplinary work. Of course, the issues of um, uh, healthy soils, 
uh, rich in microorganisms and so on, or through some in, kind of agronomic practices and others, we are already tackling the issues. But still, uh, again, we need to work collaboratively in order to come to solutions. Gentlemen over there, your name and where you are working. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. My name is Imam Ruba and I work for the MRC. Um, food security is very important in Africa, for instance, but we realize that we have over 1.3 billion wastage of food and we're talking about inequality and inequity. What can we do to redistribute food so that we reduce the amount of food that we're cultivating to save the earth? Again, another important question. Um, I would just say that countries are, tr are trying their best. Unfortunately, as far as, as we are now, uh, ECOWAS has put in place some kind of regional policies that should normally help uh, to go down to the countries and then to be implemented. But uh, I agree with you that we still have a lot to do in order to balance uh, the, the waste of, of, of food within the continent and uh, even out. I see how tomato produced in northern Burkina, for instance, uh, is, is just uh, deteriorating because uh, if, for instance, Ghanaian trucks don't come on time, uh, farmers are just losing the whole product and some are even suiciding themselves because they afforded credit to, to get the, the agricultural input and, and uh, it's a perishable product and government should also help to set and put in place some infrastructures that really support those kind of uh, small scale enterprises. Thank you very much. I think we will stop there in the interest of time. We need to move on. So a round of applause for Kibi. <laughs> Um, the next session will be chaired by Professor Swan Young. He's just arrived and uh, he is uh, actually the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic uh, of the University. No, can sit down. Uh, and uh, he has previously worked for MRC and has been the, the Provost of the Medical School for several years. So, Professor Swan Young will now take over the chair. Thank you. Um, we, we, we have four speakers in a row. Uh, since we are running a bit late, uh, I hope um, the first speaker I have on the list here is Pauline. Pauline <laughs> Shehelbrook. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you have the floor. Uh, Her presentation is on food production, supply, and international trade relevance for future food systems resilience in West Africa. Um, thank you very much. Can I use this one? Yeah. Um, all right, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to um, share some of my work here today with you. Um, I always find the link between uh, climate change and food systems quite, quite interesting, especially because Every single one of us um, interacts with the food system on a, on a daily basis. We all eat, so we all um, interact with the food system. Uh, and hence, um, climate change adaptation and mitigation is something that we all could do together. Well, one of the things I'd like to discuss today, which um, quite nicely perhaps follows on from uh, uh, Robert's talk, uh, is the role of international trade and, and Robert uh, mentioned uh, uh, already in his talk that uh, more and more uh, the products that you find on the West African market are imported uh, from, from elsewhere. So uh, I would like to um, to illustrate a little bit what that could do with food system resilience uh, and uh, what sort of considerations uh, we should make if we would like to, uh, to evaluate or perhaps rethink uh, such uh, international trade strategies. Um, so some of this I could skip uh, through quickly because I, I think Robert has already touched on this. But just to say that the uh, food system in West Af uh, well, actually globally, is not exactly um, uh, delivering the health that we 
um, I hope this is all right, um, uh, that we are um, uh, envisaging. Um, so there are lots of people uh, that live with um, um, mal in, in malnutrition, over and undernutrition, also nutrient deficiencies. Uh, so this uh, comes from the Global Nutrition Report that Robert was, uh, was mentioning as well, uh, uh, specifically for West Africa. And you see West Africa is not an exception uh, to, this, to this rule. Um, uh, with a, a large percentage of uh, the population uh, living with, uh, um, uh, or, or sorry, of children being stunted, uh, a smaller proportion overweight, uh, but also not depicted in this in this um, uh, figure, uh, quite a number of people with micronutrient deficiencies. And here you see that in in a map where uh, the darker the colour, the higher the risk of micronutrient deficiencies is, and you see that West Africa is is quite in the darker colours there on the on the left of the of the map. Well, if we look a little bit uh, closer to some of the um, foods that might be quite important in terms of uh, nutrient uh, deficiencies or to avoid uh, or prevent nutrient deficiencies, we're talking about uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts and seeds. Uh, and this uh, figure, and I hope you, you can see it, uh, shows you the, uh, the minimum risk exposure level, so um, the recommended levels for a healthy um, uh, diet, which is the uh, the line in the middle, uh, and then um, uh, the orange uh, circle is where the, the world is on average, and the red circle is where West Africa is on, on average. Um, so you can see that um, that yeah, this is all quite below the recommended levels for a, for a healthy uh, healthy diet. Uh, and uh, in terms of vegetables in West Africa, the consumption is quite a bit below the the global um, average, further away from uh, uh, the the guidelines that we would like to uh, to meet. And we all know that um, uh, these kind of crops, so the fruits and the vegetables, the nuts and seeds, are very important for our health. There is a, a, a very large evidence base uh, around uh, the health impacts of, uh, uh, of poor or low fruit and vegetable consumption uh, and um, uh, the reduction of risk if you, if you do consume more uh, fruits and vegetables in, for example, strokes and heart disease and other uh, non-communicable diseases. From an environmental perspective, um, fruits and vegetables, and to a lesser extent uh, nuts and seeds, are also quite interesting as they're not only uh, beneficial for our health, but quite often, and people that followed um, uh, uh, Rosie's learning lab on Wednesday will very much recognize these, uh, these guys. They're from India, by the way, not from uh, West Africa, but we, we don't have the West African set yet. Uh, but uh, fruits and vegetables are often also low in terms of uh, environmental footprint. They require less, uh, less water. Um, uh, they often uh, have a lower carbon footprint than, for example, uh, animal sourced foods and some of the cereals um, as well. Another uh, link that I should mention uh, in relation to uh, um, nutritionally important crops such as fruits and vegetables is that um, climate, climate change and the uh, projected um, changes in climate in the next uh, decades to come uh, might, if, this, um, uh, if we don't do anything about it, uh, have a, tr a very detrimental uh, impact on yields of fruits and vegetables later on. And this was a study that we did a couple of years ago where we uh, tried to uh, put together all the studies that have ever um, uh, been done and published in peer-reviewed literature uh, on uh, what is happening if, for example, water availability is reduced. Robert mentioned this as well, that is one of the, uh, 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 the main factors that is going to affect uh, yields, uh, cereals, but also um, um, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, um, as well as a, re uh, a reduction in the length of the, of the cropping season. Um, so you see, if, uh, fruits and vegetables are very important for our health, uh, might help in uh, climate change uh, mitigation and maybe even adaptation, uh, but also uh, we are facing some challenges with ongoing climate change uh, that we might not be able to uh, produce the amount that is required. Um, the, the 2010 FAO Nutrition Country Profile for Gambia, for example, mentions that in the Gambia, uh, currently around 100 grams of fruit 
fruits and vegetables is available on the markets per person. So you can imagine if um, if about 400 to 500 grams is recommended, uh, that um, uh, of course the, the, the whole population is suffering from um, uh, too low uh, consumption of, of fruits and vegetables um, as compared to the dietary guidelines. So what can we do to make the supply of uh, fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds uh, more resilient, especially in countries uh, such as, as the Gambia, um, uh, where, where we're seeing these climate change impacts, where we're dealing with uh, uh, water deficiencies which might, might make it um, increasingly difficult to grow enough fruits and, uh, and vegetables or crops altogether. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about trade and how trade could perhaps be part of the solution. And this is uh, through something called virtual um, water trade. So to grow a, a particular crop, um, you, you require a certain amount of water uh, for their irrigation. If it's an, uh, an animal source food, it's the, the feed of the, um, uh, the animals and then, of course, also the drinking water of the animals. Um, but once that uh, product is harvested and ready to be shipped uh, uh, to either a local uh, market or to an international market, um, this water is still embedded in there. So by trading uh, food products across the globe, we're virtually also trading uh, water. So you can imagine that if you were to trade from a country that has an abundance of, of uh, water to a country that is uh, scarce in water, uh, that that could be part of the well, it could contribute to the resilience of the food system in a country that is, um, is facing water scarcity. Um, so that would work if, if uh, we, for example, would um, produce certain uh, fruits and vegetables in Europe and would um, uh, trade them um, to South Africa, for example, a country um, that is facing severe water shortages. However, this is often not the case. This is a map made uh, by um, McConnell and Hoekstra. Um, it, it is a little bit um, old, but I, I guess it's still quite valid, uh, where, you, where you see um, how water is virtually traded ac across the globe. And it's, it's not difficult to see that uh, the countries that are probably um, not facing a tremendous amount of water scarcity are the ones that are importing from all the countries that, uh, that do face water scarcity. And this is also what we saw um, in the UK when we, when we did um, uh, a small study to look at where uh, do fruits and vegetables in the UK food market uh, come from. And uh, over time, uh, the UK has changed uh, significantly to having trade partners that were in uh, um, uh, climate, climate stable countries or uh, cl uh, countries that are not affected um, uh, that much by climate change yet uh, to importing from lots of countries that are highly vulnerable to, to climate change. And so the proportion of fruit and vegetables that were imported to the UK from countries uh, that are um, extremely uh, or highly water scarce has uh, increased significantly over the past decades. And it's, uh, something similar we saw in, in uh, India, um, where one of our uh, students looked at the interstate uh, trade of virtual water um, uh, between the different states in India, and she also saw that um, something is not quite right there, that the water scarce or the over-exploited uh, states were exporting virtual water to states that were water, uh, water safe. So therefore we were wondering, uh, how is this in, in West Africa and what sort of trends can we see? Um, and I took the Gambia as a, as a case study here, but uh, this, this sort of analysis is, uh, it, you can do it for, for every single country. It's, it's uh, making use of open source data of the, the FAO um, and, a, and a little alg algorithm that I'm very happy to share with, uh, with all of you. So what, what are the trends in trade in the Gambia? And uh, do they make the Gambian food system more or less resilient? And, and I have specifically looked at um, uh, water, water footprints of, um, of foods and whether uh, importing the foods um, uh, means that the, Gambia, the Gambian agricultural system itself has to um, uh, provide less water or um, uh, whether it's the other way around and that the trade is actually making it worse. Um, so this is a figure showing uh, the imports uh, of fruits and vegetables and nuts, and then the grey one is rice, which has another 
uh, which, which is using the scale on the right, whereas the fruits, vegetables, and nuts are using the scale on the left. And you see that over the, the past um, two decades, uh, it has increased uh, quite a lot, but obviously the population has increased as well. So if you look at the per capita imports uh, of uh, vegetables, fruits, and nuts, it has uh, kind of remained stable, but uh, the total imports, uh, imports in terms of tons have increased quite a lot. But what I was very interested in is where, where do these crops uh, come from? Uh, are they from neighboring countries? Do they come from Europe? Do they come from the United States? Ooh, this might be a bit small for you to see. Um, but on the, on the right hand side you see the, the countries where uh, the Gambia was importing these nutritionally important crops from um, uh, in 1999, uh, which is mostly from Europe and, and, and Argentina. Um, uh, and these are countries that in terms of their climate change uh, um, vulnerability um, are not impacted that much. Uh, there is not a high risk of uh, yields failing uh, in, the, in the near future. Whereas the picture in 2015 is quite different, where the Gambia is importing quite a lot from, uh, from China, uh, from southern European countries, from Latin American countries, and also from uh, neighboring countries in, in West Africa. And so I mapped all these countries and gave them uh, a vulnerability score in terms of, of uh, climate change, specifically for their um, uh, water scarcity problems, uh, uh, which is uh, something which is done by an organization called Andy Gain. Uh, they have a really nice website that you can, can explore. And then you see that um, where, in, where in 1999 uh, the Gambia was importing from, uh, from green countries, so countries that are... Um, not so vulnerable to climate uh, change. Uh, now, uh, almost half of all the uh, fruit and vegetables that are imported to uh, the Gambia are uh, from uh, countries that are moderately to highly to extremely uh, vulnerable to climatic change. So you can imagine, again, if nothing changes, um, that would be that would really jeopardise the food system resilience in terms of fruit and vegetable and nut and seed supply to uh, the Gambia. If, for example, in those countries that are uh, vulnerable to climate change, yields would, would fail, and the country decides not to, to um, export it, for example, to the Gambia anymore. Uh, given that the supply currently is already about a fifth what we would need in a, in a, in a day, that is obviously not, not very good news. So, um, what should we do, do about it? Well, food systems um, are clearly under, under pressure, and I think uh, Robert illustrated that um, very well in his, his presentation. Um, and and uh, climate change, future climate change, will cause even further pressure on these food systems in the future. It seems that uh, from these analysis that we've now done for the, for the UK, a high income country, for India and for um, the Gambia, that international trade flows don't make these food systems more resilient, rather the, the, the opposite. So what would be the way forward? Well, one of the things that we propose is that um, really we should um, map these international trade flows, flows out. And uh, FAO is providing data. It's not always in a format that is immediately usable, as sometimes they report the last layover harbor rather than the country that is producing the, uh, the food. So you get a bit of a mismatch. Um, but really studying this and rethinking this and taking responsibility also as countries to say, well, is it ethical that we are Im importing um, grapes from South Africa, for example, a country that is already um, uh, facing severe water shortages. And this, me this, is, this uh, involves high, middle and low income countries where we all have to work together. But, of course, there, um, uh, there are a lot of other uh, mitigation, education, and adaptation um, activities going on. So it's not a static uh, problem. Uh, there's lots of different ways to, to work about it. Um, um, for example, through diets, uh, through rethinking the diets, to trying to get people to consume uh, more sustainable diets that are less heavy on uh, uh, um, the water footprint, uh, uh, emit less greenhouse gases. Uh, think about other sources of uh, food that might have lower uh, water footprints and lower greenhouse uh, gas emissions, and educating children, uh, teaching them in, in, in school um, about uh, the impact that the food system has on, on climate change. And at the other hand, uh, of course, we have the, um, the knowledge 
and the technology to, to adapt to some of these challenges as well, such as um, uh, different seeds and different varieties that uh, require less water or are more drought resistant. There's a lot of research on that in uh, um, uh, staple crops and cereals, a little bit less in, in, in fruit and vegetables and nuts and seeds, but definitely the evidence uh, base is growing. Uh, we, we, we know all about um, more, uh, uh, we, we uh, know about more uh, efficient ways of irrigating our crops so that we have less uh, water losses uh, uh, on the agricultural side uh, and um, we have the knowledge to, for example, fortify certain staple crops uh, so that um, uh, people would still consume the, the, the essential nutrients even although they might uh, consume a very low level of fruits and vegetables. Um, so I'd like to end there, and I'm very happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we can take a couple of questions here. Yeah. Hello, I'm Latin Fatou al Hazan, coming from Ghana. Yes, this was a very nice presentation. My question is... Uh, on the issue of uh, food security, we know the issue is not about uh, the quantity of food we produce in Africa. Usually, uh, the issue is on uh, post having losses, especially for uh, the perishable food items. Yeah. So how does your work seek to address this issue? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think you're touching on a really uh, important uh, point here, and I think that sometimes we've gone a little bit crazy in our in our food system, where um, we talk now specifically about very perishable uh, products, fruits and, and vegetables, uh, but where um, uh, meat is on the market, that um, where the feed was grown in Latin America, where the cows were grazing in in the U.S., and where the uh, perhaps the meat was processed in China and then comes onto onto the market in an in another country. So we're not making uh, logical decisions in terms of how food is allocated, where it's traded, from, uh, from which country to, uh, to which country. And, and of course, this is a market mechanism and, uh, and, uh, and there is a supply and demand. And this is how these, uh, these kind of crazy trade flows uh, do exist nowadays. But I think now the data is there, now we will be able to look uh, more into it. And now we also know that sustainability um, uh, I mentioned water and greenhouse gas emissions, but of course there are other land use, biodiversity, and so is a very important part to consider as well. Besides the economic gain on, on a product, I think we should really re, uh, reconsider the way how uh, products are, um, are, are traded across the world. Um, uh, uh, probably towards, uh, depending a bit on where you where you live, but probably uh, towards more um, regional um, uh, markets where where foods don't have to travel so far, uh, which would definitely also have a positive impact on the on perishable products and and their shelf life. Yeah, you are. Thanks, Berlin. Um, I just want to ask, um, it is quite interesting to see how the shift in trading happened in the Gambia in the past few years. Do you have an ex explanation to this? Is it because of bottleneck of trading or is it because of low economic growth and you, we, they're trying to get areas where foods are cheaper and they're trying yeah. to import from there and what are the mitigation to that as well to reduce those risks? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think there are definitely people in this room that know much more about this than me, but um, we had a bit of a discussion about this on, on Tuesday where we had a stakeholder meeting where we said, what, what, what are the main drivers that this is changing uh, so much? Um, urbanization was mentioned as one of the main uh, drivers where people um, uh, move away from the farms into the cities, start buying their food in, in supermarkets uh, Robert was, uh, or markets. Uh, Robert was mentioning this as well. Um, uh, but there is also um, there's definitely also a role for ongoing globalization people finding each other better international trade deals becoming much more common so people finding each other entrepreneurs that see an, a uh, an opportunity and, and see that importing something from China might uh, uh, might really work well and, and, and they start up a business introducing certain products that people maybe 
didn't really ask for, but are now on the markets. People get exposed to it, like it, and, and decide to buy it. Uh, but how exactly... Um, what exactly is the, 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 the most important driver, or if it's really a, a, combination, a combination of, uh, of these factors, uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm sure there's people in, in the room here that, that know a little bit more about that. We can take one more question. Um, good morning. My name is Fatou. I work with um, the MRC. Mine is not much of a question, but more of a comment or an addition to what you're talking about. Um, taking the Gambia for an example, um, when it comes to the uh, season when we grow mangoes, you see that we have a lot I mean, a lot of wastage of mangoes. And um, to, we, we really need to do something about that. And I feel that if at all the government um, takes funds and then inputs it into the processing of those mangoes, not just the production. For example, we could have jams. We could have mango chips. We could even get biogas from these mangoes. And I think um, those are certain things that the government should look into, not just for mangoes, but for other um, f food that is being um, produced. And that could also be a source of income, not just for the Gambia, but it could also be um, a way of, you know, uh, sustainable farming for for the country. So it's just, yeah. <laughs> just a comment. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much, uh, Pauline, for such a very illuminating uh, thought. And I think there is uh, something for policymakers and the rest of us to uh, to take seriously and be more measured in decisions. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Rosemary Green. Rosemary is going to, uh, her talk is on changing food systems in West Africa and the use of natural resources. Can you just give me a couple of minutes, that's the wrong version of my slides, I'll just get the correct version. Yes, okay. She's just putting up the correct version of her presentation. Sorry for the slight delay, everybody. I just didn't want you to have the old version of the talk. I wanted to do the new version. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Thank you, Professor, for chairing the session. And thanks very much to the two previous speakers for their great talks. Um, in many ways, my talk goes slightly along with Pauline's that she's just given, because she's talked a lot about the role of trade in um, improving the resource use of food systems. And I'm here to talk about a slightly different piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah, good. Um, I'm here to talk about a slightly different piece of the puzzle, which is to do with changing diets and how those can also affect the resource use of food systems. So I'm gonna, these are the main questions I'm going to try and answer today. Uh, the first one is, how can we use national and publicly available data sets to look at food systems and diets across the world and see how their use of natural resources is changing? Um, I'm gonna look in a bit more detail about global food systems and those in West Africa specifically to see how they've changed over the last 50 years. Um, I'm gonna look at how their resource use has changed and how West African food systems compared to global averages and then I'm going to look a bit at the future and see what will happen if those trends continue. 
So the data I'm using are global data sources and the key one in terms of food availability is a data set that you might know about which is the, the food balance sheets that are produced by the Food and Agriculture Organisation and these are publicly available for anyone to use and they give data on the food produced in each country in the world the food imported and exported and therefore they can act as a proxy for the diet of that country and they're available over a very long time series so they can be really useful for looking at trends and comparing between countries. And for this study I've matched those data to a source of environmental data which can show you how much land and how much water is used to produce one kilo of each of the different types of food that people are eating in a country. And if you sum all of those together you then get what we call a land footprint and a water footprint of the diet in that country. Um, and we have data available for 15 countries in West Africa and we can look at, uh, therefore, how West African countries are comparing to global averages. So the first question really is what does this kind of analysis allow us to do and what doesn't it allow us to do? So I've done a little pros and cons slide so that you can assess you know, what this is for and what it can tell us. Um, first of all, as I said, it's really useful to compare between countries and look at trends over time. Um, and also it enables us to make sort of high level predictions for what might happen in the future, which is one of the things that I've attempted to do here. On the downside, we can't account for the food wastage that was just talked about after Pauline's talk. Um, at least we can't do it very accurately, so we don't know what food is not being eaten that was available in that country. Also, we can only look at what's being eaten. So this is about diets and dietary patterns. It's not about how the food was produced in the first place. So of course, the resource use of different foods is highly variable across the world because it's being grown in different seasons, in wet or dry seasons, and it's being produced using different uh, procedures and technologies. And we can't account for those differences. So much more in-depth research is needed that follows on from this high-level research in order to answer questions in more detail. Also, we can't look at the most recent changes. These data only go up to 2013. Um, and we can't take into account the impact of future climate change. All we can do is speculate how these uh, relationships will change under different climate change scenarios. So that's a useful type of analysis that could follow on from the early stuff that I'm about to show you. So to start with, these, these two graphs are showing you the food that's available globally in the years 2010 to 2013 and the food that was available in West Africa. And the first thing you'll see is that there's about 20% less food available in West Africa than there is at a global average. Um, so there's much less food available to start with. But actually the, the bottom two bars of both of the graphs that you can see there, the, the yellow and the orange ones, that's the cereals and the starchy roots, so the sort of staple foods. And you can see that actually around half of the diet in the West African countries is coming from those starchy staples. And the consumption of the other food groups is much lower. So the diets are much less diverse, and this is uh, responsible for a lot of the nutrition problems that Robert was talking about in his talk. There's a very different pattern of what food is available in West Africa. There's less fruit and vegetables, less meat and dairy being consumed by far. And this is the results of a piece of analysis that we were involved with that actually looked at dietary patterns around the world. Um, we've called them global food supply patterns because, again, it's not necessarily directly correlating to what people are consuming, but it's quite a good proxy for that. It was a principal component analysis, and it looked at how the different foods in the diet cluster together in different countries, and that produced these four different diet scores. Um, and you can see that by far the most prevalent one globally, and which has increased a lot over time in the last 50 years, is this one that we've called animal source foods and sugar, because those foods are very highly available in that diet. And it's what you might call a Western dietary pattern. It's associated with rising incomes, and it's also associated with non-communicable disease quite strongly. Um, so this is by far the most uh, common global diet. The one that's recently become the second most popular is the one, at the, the green one, which we've called vegetables, because it's quite strongly based on vegetables, but it's also a very diverse diet. So there's a lot of different food groups in that diet. 
And it's another diet that's associated with higher incomes and a sort of nutrition transition, as Robert was talking about. But it's a much healthier pattern. So this is a sort of diet that we might want to encourage uh, people and countries to move more towards. And the other two diets, one is a sort of starchy roots diet, and the other one is a seafood diet. Those are more prevalent in different parts of the world, but they haven't shown the kind of increase over time that the other two diets have, and they're not as prevalent these days. And if we look at West Africa, you can see that it's almost the opposite pattern with these, with these dietary scores. So the animal source and sugar score is, is at the bottom, and it's barely increased over the last 50 years, although it's beginning to now in the last few years. The vegetable score, very similar. It looks like it's beginning to increase, but not as much as it has globally. And by far the most prevalent one is the starchy roots and fruit dietary pattern, which has declined a little bit, but, uh, but, but generally the food systems have been quite static over the last 50 years. There's been very little change. Again, when you compare it to the global change, which has been huge, the food systems have not changed that much, and I'm sure that's not a huge surprise to many people here. So to move on a little bit to the use of natural resources in agriculture, um, we know that the amount of food that's globally available um, has increased by about 55% in the last 50 years, which has, uh, is partly to keep up with the growing population, but has also resulted in a slight reduction in, in undernutrition um, over, those, over that time period. But to grow all this food, of course, we need to exploit more natural resources. And in particular, today, I'm talking about land and water use. So we know that nearly 40% of land around the world and 70% of water resources are being used by agriculture. Um, this is just a little illustration of, of the land use around the world. So the darker colours for each country indicate that a higher percentage of the land is being used for agriculture. And you can see that a lot of countries around the world are already over-exploiting their land for agriculture. And then this is a picture of water use over the last 100 years or so. And the blue section at the bottom is the water that's being used in agriculture. You can see that it's the vast majority of the water that we're using. And that resource has to be competed for um, against drinking water for humans, against water that's being used in industry. All the other things that we use water for are being squeezed out by this water that's being used in agriculture. And so we need to think very carefully about how to make this more sustainable. Uh, you won't be able to see the detail on these two graphs, um, but this is, any of you who are in the learning lab that I was running on Wednesday will know that we talked a lot about the greenhouse gas emissions from different foods, and this is just using some other markers. So this is the land that it needs to be used to produce different types of food and the water on the right. And I've just illustrated a few so that you can see the differences between those two measures. Uh, so this is lamb at the top, uh, making a kilo of lamb uses a lot of land. It uses a lot more land than making a kilo of vegetables or cereals would do. And this is nuts, um, about a third of the way down. So the difference in magnitude of the land use is huge, but nuts are still higher than some other crops. And this is rice a lot further down, using a lot less land. But you can see that when we look at water, actually lamb is reasonably high, but it's only about a third of the way down. Rice is higher because rice is often irrigated and so it uses a lot more water. And at the top we have nuts. So if we're going to think about how to reduce the water, the resource use of, of food systems, there are trade-offs that, that need to be thought about in terms of the context and what resource is more scarce in any different context. So if you have a land problem, you would be thinking about growing different foods from if you have a water problem. And this is how the resource use globally and in West Africa has changed over that 50-year period that I'm looking at. Again, it's land use on the left and water use on the right. And the blue lines are the global average, and the orange underneath is, uh, is the West African resource use. And the first thing that you might notice is that the resource use is huge for both of these resources. So the global average is around 8 to 9 meters squared per person per day to produce the diet that people are currently consuming. And for water, 
it's around 400 liters per person per day to produce the diets that people are currently consuming. And this is actually just fresh water withdrawals. This doesn't include rainfall. This is just the water that's coming from ground and surface resources. Um, so the resource use is massive. Um, it's, there's been a gradual increase in land use globally, but not very much. And this is mostly because yields have been increasing due to improved technologies. Um, again, this is per person figures, so it's not affected by population increase. This is purely because diets are changing, that these figures are changing. Um, and in West Africa, it's about half of the global average for land use. Uh, water use has increased a lot more, and again, this is due to dietary change um, rather than population increase. And West African water use is about three quarters of the global average, but you can see in the last sort of 15 years, it started to increase quite a lot. And we would speculate that that's due to the fact that diets are starting to change a little bit more. Um, you would also think that, obviously, given the graph I showed you earlier, because the West African food systems are... <laughs> Uh, demanding and consuming a lot less food than the global average, that that might be why the resource use is lower, but actually that's not the case. If we adjust for the total calories available, those West African diets are still using a lot less resources than the global average. It's 50% less land and about 20% less water. But as I said, it looks like diets are beginning to change, which is a good thing for food and nutrition security, as long as they continue to change in a, in a more sustainable and resilient way. Um, so we did some predictions for what the resource use in West African countries would be like in 2050 based on those current trends. And it looks like there'd be an increase in land use of about seven meters squared per person per day, uh, which is an increase of about 40%, but it's still less than the global average, actually. Um, and, but for water use, there have been an increase of about 650 litres per person per day, which is nearly double the current usage, and it's more than the current global average. And given that there's water scarcity in many West African countries already, this is potentially going to be a serious problem in future if, if the demands on those resources continue to increase and increase. Um, and again, as I said, it may be due to the dietary change that we're seeing that, those, that that water resource use is increasing. We're looking at increased consumption of dairy and eggs and meat, and also fruit and vegetables, although as Pauline uh, demonstrated in her talk, the resource use of fruit and vegetables tends to be much lower than that of the animal source foods. So just to conclude a little bit on, on what we've found and what we think can be done about this, um, we know that there's been very little change in, in diets in West Africa for the last 50 years. Uh, there isn't the dietary diversity that, that we would want to see in terms of population health, but that is starting to change. The question is, how can it change in a way that isn't going to overexploit those resources? Um, so there are issues for potentially for future food security and climate change is going to exacerbate those issues. Um, and what can be done, I think both Robert and Pauline gave a really good overview of this in their talks uh, that we've already heard. So things like new agricultural technologies that can increase yields and reduce the, the reliance on ground and surface water, so be better irrigation technologies, etc new national and regional and international food policies, including the trade issues that Pauline was talking about, and subsidies that can focus on healthy and nutritious food to improve population health, but that can also be sustainable. It's going to be really important for the future. And then finally, behavior change uh, towards growing and eating foods that can use less of those resources and can also be resilient to climate change in future. And in many cases, those are actually traditional varieties uh, from the countries in question that could be made much better use of. Thank you very, very much for listening. And uh, I don't know if there's time for questions, but if not, please come and talk to me afterwards. I'd be happy to talk to you. If there is any questions, one or two, from the audience. Thank you. Uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation. <coughs> Sorry, I'm Dr. Kenneth Yaro. You see, why I say so? Because uh, it looks so real. And you know what is really going on in West Africa, especially. Uh, I want to say what can be done. 
<coughs> when you talk about dietary pattern in West Africa, you see there's a social cultural, a social cultural dimension to it. You know, like some people think that if you are big, if you are our best, you are looking good, you are feeling, you are looking good, you, are, you should belong to a high socioeconomic status. So that thing is there. And if you are going to the gym to reduce your weight and all that, ah, your parents will even question you that. Are you living fine? What's wrong? So there's a social cultural dimension to it. So what can we do is to let people know to be sensitized, even through clinics. Our patients department that it is uh, nothing wrong in trying to lose weight and eat uh, more nutritious food because uh, it is something you could be embarrassed. When you travel out your back, you are looking slimmer than before. They will ask you if you are sick. You know, so there have to be social cultural uh, sensitization to be able to know that you don't have to eat and feed yourself fat to be considered uh, that you are looking, you are looking, living fine. So please try to consider that as well can be done. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, you Kenneth. Just one quick one here. I can see my great on this side. Thanks. It's a great talk, thank you very much. Um, I'm, this is perhaps a rather silly remark, but water goes round. So if we use more water, that doesn't mean to say that water is going to get scarce, or does it? It's, it's not a silly question at all. Yes, there is a water cycle, of course, and uh, but the problem is that at the moment, in, in many aspects of, of human civilization, we're disrupting those natural water cycles. So we're using water that is not necessarily being replenished. The water that's in the ground reserves, for instance, if we take that water up and use it for agriculture, it does not necessarily return to the reserves that we're taking it from. So it's a case of not using the water that's available in the most sustainable way at the moment. Thank you very much um, for that uh, insightful lecture uh, to, uh, talk, uh, Rosemary. Our next speaker is Brandon Polycat. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much. And I think there's uh, three uh, really great talks that have really set up some of the things that I want to talk about uh, in my paper. So thank you for these really um, uh, rich and powerful and interesting uh, contributions that really have brought up a lot of the things that I want to talk about, which is partly issues of equity, um, but also issues of trade-offs and the kind of the collective um, definition of the values that can, can uh, guide us towards more sustainable eating. So I'm going to start by saying that I'm an anthropologist. Uh, I use ethnography, I use qualitative methods. Um, so the kinds of conclusions that I'm drawing and material that I'm presenting is going to be a bit different from what has come before. And probably my main, if maybe a little bit self-serving, take-home message from this paper is that I hope uh, to demonstrate that anthropology and ethnographic methods really have a, a role to play um, in planetary health. So for the last, uh, I'm going to be talking more about um, narratives, attitudes, and values um, today, and in particular uh, about, so the way that that plays out at the moment in my work is um, looking at taste. So for the last uh, three years, I've been working in the Dakar suburb of Pekin. Um, using participant observation, shopping, cooking, and eating in suburban households, uh, looking at how changing patterns um, of availability of food affect how food is transformed through cooking at the level of the household and changes in consumption, and how these changing patterns and how these patterns of consumption both generate and are shaped by this emerging double burden of malnutrition. So the households that I work in are characterized by the double burden of malnutrition. They contain people uh, who are managing the symptoms of non-communicable, diet-related non-communicable diseases. They also contain, uh, they're sporadically exposed to hunger, 
um, and they contain people with uh, anemia um, and people uh, underweight and and uh, and children whose whose growth has been identified as problematic. Okay, so I'm really what I'm talking about is really on the the consumption side, right, rather than the the production side. So I'm looking at the effects uh, of climate change and the effects of changing patterns on, uh, on m what The Lancet calls malnutrition's multiple manifestations, and, in, and more specifically on how these impact how households procure, prepare, and share food. And I want to think about what are healthy and sustainable diets in a West African context and what kinds of multidisciplinary um, perspectives we can use. Uh, and I think the context that I'm working in, there's certainly there's a, a high and I think an increasing sense that there isn't a shared or common understanding of what a healthy, uh, of what a local healthy um, uh, diet is. And part of the reason for that, I think, is that when people are diagnosed, for example, with diabetes, they're often given very poorly adapted information. So I was talking to somebody, uh, 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 the president of the Diabetes Association in Senegal, who was talking about how people with diabetes are told to eat broccoli, right? Because that's something which is acknowledged to be a healthy product. It's obviously not a West African vegetable and it is incredibly expensive and very, very difficult to procure. You actually have to go to the, the, the largest supermarkets to get this, okay? So that's when I, there's really kind of, there's a, a need to generate um, local locally adapted and suitable um, dietary information. And this final question that I'm working on in collaboration with colleagues uh, at Exeter, but then also with Senegalese colleagues at the University Gaston Bajar, um, we're working on this, this, the question of how we can generate and deepen consent for dietary change. So yes, from a, a West African perspective, we always think about production and availability and how we can uh, change and increase the, the, the quality, the diversity, and the amount of food available. And I, the, the last um, papers have shown that really nicely. Uh, but we also need to think about the kinds of, of choices that are being made by consumers and that are increasingly instrumental as we're going through a, uh, the nutrition transition. Okay, so, and I want to give one example that was actually alluded to in the first, uh, in the first, the first keynote. Uh, which is the, uh, the Eat Lancet Planetary Diet. So this is a diet to feed 10 billion. It's the first full scientific review of what constitutes a healthy diet from a sustainable food system. And what it's really taking is what um, they sometimes call the, uh, a food can fix it approach. So it's taking food as the starting point for what we all agree, I think, in this room are urgent and large scale, the, the urgent and large scale change which is very necessary. Um, the problem, I think, of using these kinds of, of food as a lever and an instrument uh, is that people do not, often do not feel concerned or feel affected by this because the primary for in the kinds of households that I'm working in, the primary question of food is how to get it. These are in very food insecure households. People's primary set of concerns are about having uh, access and more predictable access to food. So the claim behind the Eat Lancet diet is that these are a set of dietary targets that would greatly improve the nutrition and health status of most people, um, although there should be, uh, in some places, including West Africa, the diet does, they, they allow space um, for supplements and fortified food. And moving towards this new dietary pattern would uh, require this kind of, this drastic reduction. Um, so a, a, a probably what it, what uh, attracted the most attention was the, uh, the very small amount of meat that people were encouraged to eat under the Eat Lancet diet and the, um, the radical increase in nuts, fruits, vegetables, um, the consumption of which would have to double on a global level. Okay, so this, this has been criticized from many perspectives, so most obviously in this kind of context where we're very interested in uh, the context of production and where um, rural livelihoods uh, and the legitimacy of the state really in West Africa is to do with how uh, it's very dependent on being able to um, secure these rural livelihoods for the future. So the idea that people would uh, adopt um, adopt diets that maybe meant having less contact with meat, for example, in this context is quite controversial. 
So the first review of the, of the diet found that it was probably unaffordable um, for up to 2 billion people. So it's not such a universal diet after all, essentially. This is not necessarily a, um, a diet that's going to allow people, that's going to uh, support the nutritional status of the poorest. It really sees food systems as consumer-driven rather than supplier-driven, which, I, as, I've, as I've already argued, is quite different from the way that food is conceived in this context. Uh, and I think if you, if you examine the kind of statements that the people behind the diet make, they are very interested in uh, the, looking at the tipping point or the crunch point for the global food system that they see coming in the future when when um, consumers in the global south have, more, have greater spending power and can, as we heard in the first paper um, in the overview of nutrition, of nutrition transition, when they can access uh, different, when they can access different kinds of food. Okay, so, and I think it, that, it, that does show that it really does affect where you sit and look at this, your perspective really does affect how you see this. Because I think from the perspective of West Africa, the crunch point or the tipping point for the global food system isn't really in the future. There's a lot of dysfunction and, and problems in the present that need to be resolved. On the level of public communication and engagement with the, desire, with the diet, on the basis of my research, I think that this question of self-sacrifice and personal responsibility and taking on the responsibility as a consumer to change patterns of availability or to change, uh, to, to drive demand in a more sustainable way. Uh, I, in the context of food insecurity, my impression from my research is that that really doesn't work. Okay, so people don't respond, they don't find that to be uh, an appropriate or even a compassionate way to address people who are struggling um, to, to eat and to assure their household food supply. And then finally, I think it really overlooks the intrinsic sustainability of local and regional food systems, and that also blocks our ability to learn from that, okay? So it really, if you look at the way that people eat, particularly in West African cities, you will see that it's a really incredibly complex mix of artisan, uh, ultra-processed, hyper-local and global food. Okay, so I think we need kind of more research that shows us, and hopefully qualitative research, that, that looks at the, uh, the sustainable values that are already present in local and regional food systems. And with my partners, we're particularly using a, uh, a city-region food system approach, which I hope will allow us to do that. So this is to um, present a little bit of the project that we're doing. Uh, it's partly inspired by the citizens' assemblies in France and the UK, um, which uh, in France they were established by Macron, and they, they're not consultation activities. They're supposed to allow a randomly selected group of people, around 150 people, who are representative of the border population, to make decisions about what kinds of climate policy, in this case to drive down emissions uh, to reach the 40% by 2030 uh, goal, to deliberate and to weigh and to compare a range of different policy decisions, okay? So what we're kind of inspired by that, by the work that we're doing in Dakar, which is um, to do with examining the kinds of values uh, that can create greater local sustainability in the, in the regional food system. Okay, so we're using competency groups of stakeholders in urban eating. Obviously, everybody is a stakeholder uh, in urban eating. The way that we're defining that is to bring together home cooks, market women, fishermen, and farmers. So we're also trying to get a range of perspectives from both production and consumption sides, and to look at the, how those priorities might be different, but how they might th hopefully, through deliberation and dialogue, come to be um, more aligned. Okay. Um, so I would finish with, I'm very unused to doing this as a social scientist, but I noticed that the, the people were finishing with recommendations on their slides. So on the basis of my research in Dakar and these ongoing projects that use uh, what we, well, that use deliberative methodologies for complex decision making, um, we're very interested, these are just some recommendations for, for deepening accountability and promoting sustainable diets. 
Okay, so the first is to do with increased income support. So we saw from this review of the... Uh, uh, of the, the possibility and the feasibility of the Eat Lancet planetary diet, that this is not some, this is not a, because of the, um, the, mainly because of the cost at the moment of fruit and vegetables, this is not something that would be accessible to the poor. And because I work on the double burden of malnutrition, one thing that people often ask me about in the UK is whether or not we should abandon cash transfers as a piece of policy, as a piece of kind of anti-poverty policy and development policy, because they, whether it may be that cash, that cash transfers appear to be driving the nutrition transition and the emergence of the double burden of malnutrition. And I always say that I think it's really important not to diminish, actually to, to make a further commitment to income support and cash transfers um, so that people uh, have the ability to eat something closer to uh, this global reference diet. I also think that there is a... The, we've heard a lot about food and vegetables today. This is incredibly important in terms of non-communicable disease. Uh, the, obviously, the, the cost is the primary point. There are also, I think, uh, important social marketing campaigns that, that perhaps need to happen around fruit and vegetables um, because there is a low, generally, uh, where in the households that I work in in Dakar, there is a, a low interest in fruit and vegetables. The, the second um, suggestion is that, and this is something that we uh, are doing together in our collaboration, is that we need to document and valorize the, what are often uh, dismissed as food coping strategies. So the kinds of strategies that are uh, adopted by the poor to protect um, against this rampant economic uncertainty and food insecurity, and in particular, um, food sharing. And the city region's um, food systems approach is particularly looks at strengthening existing commensal practices. And in fact, the, the, what really made me want to work on this relationship, this very complex relationship between chronic disease and food insecurity, was that I could see that in these households, there was a real fragmentation in the integrity of eating groups and eating collectivities. So people were beginning uh, to, to, to break apart. There was a multiplication of preparation, and there was a great uh, kind of a lot of controversy and a lot of mistrust in the integrity and the nature of food. And that was even more striking because it seemed to me that it was happening much more or there was much more contestation and concern about food than there was, for example, when I was in Dakar doing my PhD research in 2007-2008 when there was huge fluctuation in, with prices and people were really having um, problems uh, accessing food. So this seemed to me very striking. So then another suggestion is to really take action on the commercial determinants of health. So in, uh, in Senegal, the Patterson company, this is what I say when I'm talking about the local production of ultra-processed food. This isn't necessarily foods that are coming from outside and distorting uh, or making impossible indigenous forms of eating. Um, these are local food companies, uh, very unregulated, in fact supported um, by the World Bank because they are so profitable. And they are very integrated with the uh, informal food sector. So if you've been in a West, if anyone visits a West African market, you can see these kinds of uh, powdered, um, powdered milk, uh, soy sauce being decanted uh, into plastic bags and distributed to the poor. So this kind of, the way that uh, new West African food companies and the, the, I think, growing West African food industry locks together with the inform informal economy is something really to, to look at in the future because it is food insecure people who are the target market for ultra-processed food. And the, the head of Patterson has said that he wants to champion the the African food industry from Dakar to Djibouti. Okay, so it's really opening up uh, the Sahel, people in rural parts of the Sahel, and people who are un unambiguously among the poorest people in the world. These are the new target market um, for processed food. And then finally, um, I think it's important, I've suggested one strategy of uh, deliberative methodologies. These are both for producing uh, a different kind of information about the food system um, and for hopefully achieving uh, this um, maybe less defined goal of deepening democratic participation, of building consent for dietary change. And then finally, I hope that 
maybe you are considering already, uh, or you will consider in the future, integrating social science and humanities researchers into, uh, into local responses and into planetary health work more broadly. And if anybody is interested in uh, any kind of social science work on food in West Africa or using qualitative methodologies, I will be delighted to talk uh, in the time that remains. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, quick questions. Okay. Thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, everything I heard here uh, tell me that there is a real problem. In the level as a clinician, uh, we have lots of problems uh, to take care of our patients. I think that we need really a holistic group to see what we can do. Uh, at the hospital, for example, uh, when we were in, I'm in the pulmonary department, for all the patients that are in come in the department, we have at least 50% of the patients that have malnutrition. BME uh, was around 15, 16 for adults. Mm. I don't talk about uh, children. That is a real problem because it's uh, the cause of the delay of healing of our patient. It's, I think it's really a cause of uh, complications that we have about some, uh, some diseases. Uh, the other point is, for example, uh, we are in West African, for example, the West African Research Network for TB. We know that TB, one of the, uh, the etiology of TB, it's really uh, malnutrition and it's a visual circle about TB and malnutrition. If we don't do anything about malnutrition, we never end TB in, in our countries. And we, can, we don't see really the linkage between NTP, National TB Program, mm. and Malnutrition TB Program. And I think this kind of, uh, this kind of study can help us to see what we can do at, uh, at the patient levels just to improve their healing. Uh, it was some remarks that I want to tell you. I, I'm really interested. I think it's really need to have a network, not only on planetary to um, uh, planetary health, climate change, uh, but about all of the diseases that we have to manage mm -hmm. for our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I don't have very much to add to that apart from that's a very powerful uh, comment and contribution. Um, we also, one of the things that we're working on a lot in Senegal is trying to get some of these responses and observations also integrated into universal health coverage programs, which at the moment, certainly for non-communicable disease, um, but equally for a lot of um, dietary questions across the life course are not represented. So I think that's another important area to look at. Good morning. I am Sini. So I wanted to ask about, um, because we all know that animal agriculture uses more land, mm. more water, and then is the main driver of climate change, methane gas. Mm. So my, my question is, how do we link animal agriculture with um, your presentation? Because you are talking about planetary mm. health, and then others out there, maybe JBS, McDonald, Cargill, that are causing huge deforestation in the Amazon and other areas. So how do we link that with the dairy industry to make people understand about all these stuff that you are talking about? Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's an excellent point, and it comes back to one of the themes that has emerged over the, the last couple of days, which is about you know, how you have a national approach coordinated with, a, with an international crisis. 
And I think that one of the things that we want to encourage is that, in that sense, the idea of the planetary diet as a utopian idea, as a thought experiment, is incredibly powerful because it is rooted in a vision of equity, even if, for me, it's not actually equitable because it doesn't take account of the existing inequities, if you see, if you see what I mean. But one of the things that we want to do in the deliberative work is to establish what it's not just to say, okay, well, how should people eat and how do people want to eat in West Africa? It's to use uh, West African contentions, experiences, and values to redefine what a planetary diet is, which means that the group of people who are working in Dakar with a shared expertise absolutely have the authority to generate recommendations for at a global level, and they may well generate recommendations that say, look, the place, where, the place in the global food system where consumers can have the biggest impact is in the global north. It would be it would helpful in terms of food security in West Africa if people in the global north stopped eating farmed fish um, so that we, we could have more control over our fisheries. Okay. So in a sense, it's, it's a more provocative thing that says, okay, the planetary diet cannot work if it is just defined from the north and imposed on the south, but if it travels back what what is what and is rooted in the experience of people with lived experience of food insecurity, you know, with an enormous amount of understanding about that, what happens if it goes back and what do people have to say back to that? Thank you very much for that Thank presentation. Uh, I want to ask one question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, just, um, I just want to ask about the perception of healthy diet because like um, we have different thinking of what is a healthy diet between the West and then the South for instance and have you investigated to understand actually how people think in West Africa for instance of what a healthy diet is when compared to other developing countries and because this is relevant for education awareness mm -hmm. and policies as well. Yeah, I mean I would say that if you think about the values that inform eating in this context, whether or not eating is healthy is probably third or fourth in the list, right? And we can probably, through education, change some of that. But I think people's primary expectation is that they will maintain contact with heritage tastes, they'll maintain contact with cultural traditions. And I think what my work argues in particular, I'm very interested in taste. I think taste is the most, is a really, really important thing to better understand. And actually taste is the way that people experience and get a lot of information about trade. Because if people think about being at the bottom of a very long value chain, or being at the, being a, a, a thinking of their place in the global food system changing, the way that they normally explain that to me is to say, my food tastes bad, my food used to taste much better, the vegetables used to be much fresher, and now my food tastes so bad that I have to, if it is to be acceptable to my family, I have to engage in safle and I have to overload it with, you know, in it with a lot of different kinds of ingredients to really change. Yeah. So this is a really subjective, but I think people are, primar are primarily motivated by uh, cultural heritage and transition and, and wanting to invest in the value of continuity in that sense with taste and with food practices. And any sustainable diet approach has to respect uh, and take into account that that is people's primary objective when, when they eat, in my opinion. Well, um, just before your talk, uh, I think Kenneth there was uh, talking about the same kind of issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Qualiget, for that. <laughs> Our final speaker in this session is uh, Kalista Chan on malaria. Thanks. Good morning. So I think my talk will be a, bit, a little bit different from the rest of the talks. I'll be talking a bit more about agriculture and infectious disease rather than nutrition and a little bit more about mosquitoes. So rice and malaria, why should we be worried about this relationship? Oh, sorry. In 
if you can see here, it is clear that rice fields are ideal breeding sites for malaria vectors. Here in just one dip, which is 350 milliliters, we found more than 200 late stage larvae, which would soon turn into adults ready to bite people. So you can imagine what it's like living next to an irrigation scheme. We need to remember that there are two players behind this problem, the agricultural sector and the health sector. Um, and we need to understand that in Africa, where there is an increasing population, food security and self-sufficiency is very, is very ne necessary, so rice cultivation is also very important. There are many challenges that come with rice cultivation as well. Rice production in Africa has been failing to keep up with increasing demand and therefore is highly reliant on imports. So on the one hand, the agenda of ministries of agriculture in Africa are planning for a major expansion of irrigated rice. For example, in Cote d'Ivoire, where I'm based, there has already been an increase in rice harvested areas from less than 400,000 hectares in 2007 to more than 1 million in 2016 alone. But on the other hand, ministries of health and agriculture are planning for the elimination of malaria. So how are these plans going to interact and would one interfere with the other? We are focusing on the relationship between rice and malaria in Africa rather than in Asia, even though there is much more rice there. Um, and this is because although rice land anophilines, which are malaria vectors, are present everywhere around the world, in most regions they are not important vectors. In sub-Saharan sub Africa, however, the vectors associated with rice fields are very are the very efficient Anopheles gambi, efficient because of their high longevity and high preference for biting man. And these vectors are the main reason why 90% of malaria remains in Africa. Rice growing areas produce more mosquitoes than non rice growing areas. Here is an example in Tanzania where the study compared two things human biting rate and entomological inoculation rate between different agroecosystems. They demonstrated here that flooded rice irrigation results in a much higher abundance of malaria vectors and EIR, where 1,600 infective bites can land on one person per year, in contrast to 400 in sugarcane areas and less than 5% in wet savanna areas. The higher vector abundance in rice areas led to people asking whether malaria prevalence was higher in rice uh, communities too. So a series of studies in the 1990s were conducted. When reviewed, the phenomenon called Patty's Paradox was found, where even though there were more malaria vectors in rice communities, rice communities did not have higher amount of malaria. Instead, in some of these places, malaria incidence in rice communities was even lower. Many hypotheses were suggested to explain such a, such a paradox, and the most widely accepted one was wealth creation. It proposed that rice farmers earned more money and therefore had better socioeconomic conditions, better housing, better access to health care, and ca can afford drugs and nets. And all these characteristics offered more protection against malaria. So it was concluded that rice does not make the malaria problem worse, but actually helps with economic development. So this consoled the agricultural sector, encouraging further expansion of rice areas in Africa. But there are several reasons why this relationship needs reinvestigation. Firstly, the complacency about creating malaria mosquitoes was never justified. We should always try to avoid making vector breeding sites. Like mentioned earlier as well, rice harvested areas in Africa are increasing. And thirdly, the series of studies that came to the Paris Paradox conclusion were performed during a time when most of Africa had very high level baseline, uh, high, very high baseline levels of transmission, when most of Africa was under saturation. So saturation is when a large proportion of infectious mosquito bites fall upon people who are already infected. And this means that a significant difference in epidemiological indicators like prevalence may not be seen between rice and non-rice areas, even if there was indeed more intense transmission in rice areas and according to entomological measures like entomological inoculation rate. 
So this raises the possibility that in some of these studies, rice communities were actually subjected to more frequent inoculations of malaria parasites, but there was no observed impact on epidemiological outcomes because the non-rice communities have already reached saturation. Since then, the malaria situation in Africa has changed completely. The universal coverage of interventions means that all communities have similarly high levels of coverage of bed nets, drugs, and access to healthcare. So you cannot assume that non-rice communities are less protected against malaria. Uh, and because of the scale up of these interventions, malaria prevalence has decreased across Africa. So Africa is no longer under the saturation levels of malaria. And therefore, we wanted to uh, re-examine this relationship. So our hypotheses were that comparing malaria prevalence between rice and non-rice growing communities, more recent studies and areas under high underlying intensity, uh, under low underlying intensity would not experience the paradox. So we calculated ratios to represent the associations between rice and each entomologic outcome, where ratios greater than one, which are the bars in orange, indicate that the outcome is higher in rice communities. We confirmed that in rice growing areas, vector density was higher than in non-rice areas, as you can see in the first graph there. And although sporozoite rate was lower, which is the amount of parasites in the mosquito, ERR was still higher in rice areas. This suggested that the large number of mosquitoes actually compensated for the low sporozoite rates, and that's why ERR was still higher in rice communities. For the epidemiological measures, we, we calculated ratios for prevalence as well, and we arranged the studies according to the year of study to to see that there is a slight trend. All those studies saw less malaria in rice than control villages, as you can see in the turquoise bars. But in some of the more recent studies, we see that we see that there is higher prevalence in rice growing areas. This trend, however, is not that clear, mainly because there aren't a lot of uh, recent studies. So looking at the studies according to underlying malaria intensity, we see a clearer trend. Areas under high baseline prevalence experience the Patty's paradox, whereas studies conducted in areas under low malaria intensity did not see the paradox. So rice, in fact, did lead to increased higher malaria risk in these areas. So we can conclude that the mosquitoes are not and were never harmless. Before scaling up, there was little protection against malaria in most poor rural communities, and there was increased um, and there was increased vectorial capacity due to rice. But this did not produce higher malaria prevalence because of saturation. Other factors like better access to treatment uh, tended to increase to reduce prevalence in these rice areas. So now with higher and more equi equitable coverage of interventions, it is clear that rice tends to increase malaria transmission. So how can we grow rice without growing mosquitoes? And whose problem is it really? Should the agricultural or the public health sector tackle this problem? Some people in agriculture um, may say that bed nets need to be given more to rice communities, but is this really that sustainable of a solution? How can they work together to integrate and work on this problem? So we are very lucky to collaborate with two CGIR centers, Africa Rice and International Rice Research Institute, because we think that rice experts should know sooner and better than anyone else what effect their recommended production methods have on mosquitoes. They are already account accounting for parameters like rice yield, water consumption, labor intensity, and weed production. So we, when they are testing for new or improved technologies, vector abundance should be included as another measure to account for. One such technology that has gained popularity is alternate wetting and drying irrigation. It was developed as a strategy for climate change mitigation and adaptation because rice fields are major users of water resources and also a very important producer of methane. They're actually responsible for 11% of the methane emissions worldwide. It is 
the AWD is capable of significantly reducing both water use and greenhouse gas emissions while maintaining yields. And this irrigation method is similar to another one called intermittent irrigation, which was advocated for by entomologists. In this case, fields were actively drained every few days at a rate often enough to kill the larvae before they are able to turn into adults. It can reduce mosquito numbers up to 95%, but probably because it was entomologists trying to grow rice, it was not taken on board by farmers. AWD, on the other hand, is being taken up by many countries in Southeast Asia. So clearly, we need to advocate <coughs> mosquito control methods in rice through the rice sector. So we have set up field experiments in West and East Africa, and we will conduct experiments to see, to understand if and how we can integrate both AWD and intermittent irrigation to potentially have a transdisciplinary win-win-win-win solution that can achieve good rice production, reduce water consumption, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and reduce malaria vector production. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Um, the, the drying, if I may ask, how is that just left to dry or is there... Yeah, so it's passive draining and if water... It, so you install field water tubes into the field and if the water goes below 15 centimeters, you re-irrigate again. So it entirely is dependent on evapotranspiration. Fascinating. University of the Gambia. Thanks for a very nice presentation. Um, I think I agree with you that we should try to reduce as much as possible production of vectors. No question about that. But you know the the relationship between uh, abundance of vector and malaria is not linear. It's not. It's complex. So particularly in this kind, I'm very pleased to see that you mentioned Madeleine Thompson paper. Uh, that show that in Brikamaba here in this country, uh, the higher, I mean, the higher density of vector translating lower malaria, right? And so, uh, and that kind of observation was explained by us by the fact that you know the more mosquito you have, less survival you have. So you know the vector doesn't survive long enough to transmit malaria. But you know you can have other explanation, of course, right? So I think it's um, my my. Uh, I think my impression is that uh, it probably varies quite a lot from one country or one area to the other. So yes, in some countries this may result into an increased risk of malaria, but in other countries actually it does not. So I wonder if in your studies that you're going to do, you're going to try to collect some data to, or information to try to understand better the, this kind of relationship. Thank you. Well, I agree with you completely. Each each location varies very um, varies completely, and well, unfortunately, we don't have much funding to work on this relationship at the moment. But if we could, we would. And this the relationship between sporozoite rate and vector abundance is also very interesting because if we if we see higher vector numbers, we see that sporozoite rates may actually be, actually be lower, but we don't know whether it truly compensates for um, the higher vector numbers. So that definitely is something that is worth looking at. And yeah. <laughs> All right. My name is Margaret Pinder, I work for MRC. Um, the one other factor that we should put into this is that as we are reducing malaria considerably, I mean, it's quite striking in the Gambia, I assume it's happening elsewhere, I think then we will get people who are less and less immune to malaria, and then even low levels will have a clinical impact. Um, and so I think we do need to try and use dry rice preparations as much as possible. Thank you. Sounds more. Uh, is a comment? Do you, 
you want to say anything on that? Oh no, I agree okay. completely. If we could grow rice without um, going using water, it would be ideal. But because of problems with wheat production, we need to use water somewhat. And we could advocate for upland rice, but the yields are just too low to sustain um, rice production in Africa. So. Oh. Um. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was going to ask about that. Um, upland rice, which has been here for centuries and centuries and has been sustainable in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think it definitely depends on the country. Any questions, further questions? Thank you very much, you. Uh, Dr. Shan. Uh, that brings to a close this session. We are sorry we are running late again, um, but I think um, well worth the discussions and the presentations. We thank all the presenters. Uh, Dr. Bojan, do you want to say anything? You were chair at the beginning here. Uh, we thank all the uh, presenters and uh, I personally also thank Dr. Bojan. Uh, for beginning the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Usman Yan, University of the Gambia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, my name is Professor Sidat Yaf, University of the Gambia. And uh, we have a presentation now on capacity building. And after that, then we have one more presentation before we go for coffee break. That's the logistics, right, Demo? Yes. Good, thank you. Uh, now I'll call on Professor Dalda Kone. Professor Dalda Kone is a you know, professor of agrophysiology and mycology, and he specializes in plant pathology. He is currently the director of capacity building at Waskal headquarters in Accra, Ghana. So his topic is going to be on capacity building. So let's give it up for Professor Kone. Professor Kone. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sidat for giving me this, this opportunity. I want to thank the uh, organizer to invite in, uh, for inviting Rascal to be part uh, of uh, this uh, uh, meeting on behalf of uh, Rascal team. I want also to thank uh, Professor Yafa, uh, who is the uh, current uh, director of Rascal uh, uh, Graduate School, Doctoral School uh, in the Gambia here, uh, climate change and education. So this, uh, I will talk about uh, capacity building, but I want to say also I just start uh, as uh, the new director of capacity building of Rascal uh, January 6th. But before I was uh, in Côte d'Ivoire as the director of, of Rascal since uh, 2013. So I know Rascal. Uh, this is uh, what uh, I want to say. Uh, capacity building is also a response to climate change. It's uh, a nice response. We see how capacity building can uh, improve the life of uh, people, uh, how capacity building can help also to reduce the effect of climate change. Pascal uh, is uh, working on that. But before, I want to see with you what kind of challenges we are facing. It's a lot of challenges. It started by all of those things, global warming, demographic, evolution, and a social crisis. We have seen that uh, in most of the country, even if uh, the price of bread grew up, we see some social crisis. It's uh, due to a lot, uh, lot of uh, things, including climate change, and also because we are not uh, able to produce as uh, we want to produce because of uh, uh, need of water, need of uh, temperature increasing. So we need to uh, move forward doing a lot of things like capacity building. 
And this capacity building can address also in several uh, you know, different issues. We have uh, different level of capacity building, starting by sensitization at uh, individual communities and regional level. This is a uh, different level of capacity building. We have many three level, and also we can also uh, move to meeting, conferences, discussion, celebration of uh, some days like uh, uh, biodiversity day, for example, like ozone days. We have a lot of things like this where we can use opportunity to uh, to share with our communities what we know about uh, climate change. And also we can develop uh, some short courses. This is a specific, uh, specifically addressed to some people to improve their skills in a, a specific to on specific topic. We can also move to, uh, to train a, a large number of person developing curricula. This is also, and uh, at individual level, it's uh, better to understand what is going on. This is uh, if you want to go and uh, to have a relationship. And also at group level, we have an organi uh, organization of uh, uh, capacity building. It's better to understand between those groups what is going on, how we can collaborate to address some issues very important. And also at community level, we go sectoral, sector by sector also to develop capacity building. It can be uh, addressed uh, at school, uh, between in community, in your family, uh, starting by people who are around you, and also going to uh, the schools, and going also to different kind of school, and uh, to high school. This is what we can also address capacity building. You don't need to... We are, good, we are doing a lot of work, um, and also we are doing a lot of publication. If you build a very good publication, and... Uh, we know that the publication is uh, uh, very, very nice, but this publication needs also to be addressed in uh, a, a language to some people who need this result. We are happy with your publication, very nice, but who will benefit to this publication? Is scientists? No. Scientists need this, but more people need that publication because we work with all of those people, we need to share we need to use a way how we can share those publications. And uh, for Wascal, Wascal is uh, working on uh, this climate change issue and uh, using a capacity building to uh, African countries because it's important uh, to use this. And uh, just uh, to see how Wascal is, is a uh, West African Science Service Center on Climate Change and Adapted Land Use. Pascal has been created in 2009, since uh, that uh, school uh, started to be established in 2012. And uh, Pascal uh, has been endorsed by ECOWAS, West African uh, countries, by 2014. And uh, his work on uh, his focus on uh, climate, science, climate services using uh, two, uh, two more pillars. The first pillar is research. Uh, capacity building before and after is a uh, research and uh, Rascal is uh, organizing like I will uh, show you we have organogram we have ministerial council in West African countries and uh, after that we have a board Rascal has a board uh, we have an um, executive director and close to him we have scientific advisory board committee who is uh, the scientific committee who can evaluate uh, everything is uh, going on through uh, uh, capacity building and research. We have also a capacity building department and research department. The capacity building department is based in Accra and the research department is based in Ouagadougou. We call this research department Cap uh, competence center. And uh, I'm very happy to tell you that uh, University of Ouagadou gave uh, three hectares of land to build the new capacity building uh, uh, building. But uh, it will cost, but it will be fully uh, um, built by German cooperation. 
and in capacity building on which we are, we have uh, 12 schools, 12 schools, 12 graduate schools. We have uh, in blue, we have uh, all, of, all of blue are francophone. Uh, in uh, green, we have anglophone countries, and here we have visophone country, who is Capo Verde. You can see how Rascal is uh, established in West, in West Africa between 11 uh, countries in West Africa with 12 schools. I hope that uh, the school, the master in uh, climate change and health will be the, the 13th school of Rascal soon, based in Gambia. Rascal vision is uh, to seek and become as one of African leading science-based institution to provide climate services for all West Africa and all the region and beyond West Africa. This is the vision. It will do through the mission to provide information and knowledge to local, national, and regional level and uh, to all of the member country of Rascal. Because as you, you have seen, through capacity building, we can develop a lot of technologies. We can also develop a lot of knowledge we need to share with population, we need to share with communities through the result of a student. Because uh, the topics of all of the students are not designed uh, in the office. The topics of a student are bottom up. We did national consultation, we did regional consultation in each country, coming up with some more, more challenges, and we use those topics, those challenges to give to students as a topic to develop uh, their thesis and master degree. The capacity building component in Rascal is not only schools. We have a graduate school, we have GSP, but we have seen also we have three other pillars who are the component of capacity building. We develop seminar short courses. As I said, it's better to have a good result, but it's better also to share those uh, transferable results to communities so they can use what we have developed to adapt and also to mitigate. We are visiting scholar uh, program. Pascal is a partner, working with partner for visiting scholar. We use our alumni, alumni to go and uh, to be mentor of uh, other students and also we go to other uh, countries to share what Rascal has developed. And also we have uh, a building local capacity uh, policy oriented research. Because through this, we develop each student of Rascal, PhD student, before to graduate, you need to develop what we call a policy brief. Policy brief is a document. We need to use this to go to decision maker uh, to tell that this is why this student from Gambia, from Gambia, went in Mali to do his thesis in uh, climate change and agriculture. This is the result, the main result we can share with uh, a decision maker and also the decision maker use that to go and to decide, to decide what is going on, what decision one can take also. Is also an ethnic consideration. We are doing ethnic consideration because we are doing research research, we are working with our community, we are working with people, we need to do this ethic consideration and also intellectual properties. Because the funding, we need also, if you have major funding, we need to protect. It should be a book, a nice book, it should be a, a very nice funding where you can use uh, to generate uh, a kind of result or a kind of uh, uh, revenue we can also do this property intellectual. Don't uh, give free everything. This is a map of schools at Rascal. As I said, uh, you have uh, 12 schools in Africa, starting by Capo Verde and going to Nigeria or Niger. We have uh, 12 schools. The school, uh, a different school uh, with uh, a different topic. Like, for example, in Mali, we have uh, a graduate doctoral school in climate change and agriculture. In the Gambia here, 
We have doctoral school in climate change and education. Niger, we have climate change and energy. In Côte d'Ivoire, we have climate change and biodiversity. In Nigeria, we have two schools. One is in African climate system. The second is climate change and human habitat. So we have a lot of uh, a, a, a diverse school where in each school, where do we launch uh, application, we recruit one person for each country, each rascal country. As you can see, if you have uh, 11 uh, students coming in Uganda and going, coming from also uh, 10 countries plus one of Gambia, it will be 11 students who will graduate in climate change and education. So Gambia will uh, do a sort of response to climate change for West African uh, countries. This is how Rascal is functioning. It's not said that uh, the school is Mali or Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso helps to select only people from Burkina Faso. So all of those things we work together to work on application and how to select a student, the best student. Uh, it's not uh, only based on uh, the knowledge or background, based on also on other consideration. And in each school, for example, uh, in a PhD school, we have uh, six months for courses uh, before, because uh, we know that those uh, students are coming from different backgrounds. We run uh, six month courses to, to know how to collect data, how to analyze data, to harmonize everything. And uh, uh, for master school, it's a uh, first semester, as we do in master. And uh, the thesis also is defined in English. After the selection of student, the Francophone student went to uh, Cape Coast in Ghana for three months courses in English. The Anglophone school go to LMA in Togo to learn French. And after the graduation, they can speak the two languages. And they can be also uh, easily available for jobs. At now, we have, uh, you can see here, for example, uh, the alumni where they come from, climate change water resource in Benin, 20 students uh, from West Africa have already trained. And uh, for all of the students, uh, uh, graduate program here, except uh, Burkina Faso and Cap Verde, those uh, two schools we start uh, this year. We start already because we received students last week. And uh, what Rascal have developed in terms of uh, capacity building, we have uh, developed already 250, we have already 258 uh, students. And among those uh, students, uh, we have uh, 69 uh, uh, male and uh, 31 female. That means it's only focus on uh, male. Uh, we have, uh, we use uh, gender balance, it's very important, and having uh, 30, 30 or uh, more than 30 is very important for gender balance in, uh, in the world. And also, among uh, uh, the student arrow, we have uh, one, uh, 187 who already graduated. We can see in PhD, we have uh, uh, 67 student graduated in PhD and the rest is a master student. And you can take also where those students are working now. You can see in uh, this uh, last, uh, on, on your right, where those students are working for government agency, climate change agencies, uh, NGOs, consultancy and private firm. Mm -hmm. It means that all of the students who graduated can find easily job. And uh, this is about uh, capacity building. But for the seminar and courses, Rascal also uh, is working on those seminar and courses and uh, have the ability to train uh, in January or in February uh, a workshop with scientists uh, in West Africa. This is uh, what also the, the side of capacity building or uh, beyond our capacity building to uh, training a school or graduate student, Rascal is doing. And also in uh, 
in the block uh, where we develop our policy is also Rascal is working already with alumni, I said. Alumni are a mentor for a lot of students and uh, we are working uh, with uh, some projects uh, with NASA and uh, other institutions. For visiting scholars also, Rascal uh, develop uh, this kind of uh, uh, short courses also to learn, to capacitate people through the project powers. We call this project powers, it's a project between uh, Rascal and uh, some countries, Morocco for example, where people or uh, alumni of Rascal went to this country to uh, be mentor of uh, master student and uh, to, to, to learn them for some uh, uh, to capacitate them. And also we receive students coming from other countries in uh, different schools to learn during uh, one week, it could be uh, two weeks, and after developing a sort of short curricula. And for this uh, specific topic on climate change uh, in uh, uh, climate change on health, I think that uh, as Waskal has been done, like Waskal has been done, we can start between uh, collaboration between Waskal, London School, and University of Gambia by MMU. MMU, we think that uh, the MMU will be by the base of the collaboration. And after we move to design curricula, we can have uh, design also the advisory board or constitution and uh, move to select, uh, how we say, uh, lecturer who will come, uh, maybe in Gambia or in London or in other country, West African country, to teach those students. And also we develop, uh, we can develop also the color application and to start uh, the courses. It can take uh, one year, it can take two years, it depends on how the collaboration will be established and how the fund will, mobilize, will be mobilized. Because fund mobilization is very important for this kind of master. This is uh, uh, some partners of Rascal. I don't know uh, if it's not small, but we can see a lot of uh, West African countries, a lot of uh, German countries, institutions also are uh, involved. I want to say that Rascal is fully supported by uh, BMBF, who is uh, a German, a German uh, minister, federal minister for higher education. And also, we have also other partners who are on board, on board, working with uh, Rascal for knowledge or development of knowledge or sharing knowledge and also dissemination of knowledge. This is some example of uh, graduation. One, uh, we can see uh, those people are different because uh, we have people from uh, Abome Kalavi coming from the defense. We have also a lecturer coming from other countries uh, for the defense of Sudan. This is because of the collaboration already established between those countries. We can, uh, we need all of you here, if you are interested, uh, we can uh, go to see, see that, to see how we can do in terms of capacity building, and we can say, see, try to see if we can have you as a lecturer or also a co-supervisor of our student, because it's very important for us to have a lot of scientists who can share the knowledge with our student. This is a student uh, who got uh, the certificate, that's why we said that it's a, a very, very good response to climate change. Those persons will go to work in diverse institutions and also to share those knowledge, to train people, uh, starting by uh, community level, going to different school and high school also. And Rascal also, uh, this is the, the end of my talk. We can see uh, uh, more than uh, 250 alumni and uh, we are working uh, with ECOWAS uh, countries. We have now, for now, uh, 11 ECOWAS countries on board. The aim is to have the four remaining countries on board to have uh, 15 ECOWAS countries on board with Waskal. Uh, I want to thank you too much for listening, and uh, I'm open for your question. Thank you so much.
Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kone. I am happy to report that since Waskal started the academic program in 2000, we started two years uh, late. We started in 2014. But our citizens have gone to all the places uh, and they started their programs in 2012. Up to today, we have Gambian 10 PhD holders in different disciplines of climate change and 12 uh, master degree holders in different disciplines of climate change. So that's phenomenal for the Gambia. <laughs> so the floor is open now for questions. Thank you very much, Professor Kone. This is a great presentation. Um, on behalf of the MSU in the Gambia at the London School of Tropical Medicine, I would like to really express my availability yeah. to participate to the master. Uh, climate change and health, I mean the unit has quite a lot of expertise that can be used into the master. Um, and we really hope that this is going to go fast. Uh, we are happy to provide you know, contribution in terms of lectures, lectures you know, uh, and other contribution that, that we will see in terms of also maybe, you know, availability of lab, laboratory space and so on and so forth, right? Um, so I think we are very enthusiastic about that, also because we organized together with the University of the Gambia this conference because we want to really start to I mean, we already started, but we want to strengthen our research into climate change and health. And having a master here on climate change and health is a fantastic opportunity for everybody in terms of having the um, trainees, the students also to carry out research. So there can be a, a, quite a inter good interaction between uh, the teaching activity and the research activities. I have one question because I think your, your, your results are great. Um, you have a lot of PhD students, uh, more PhD students than master students, uh, which is justified by the fact that you have more PhD schools than yeah. master schools. Yeah. My question is about the um, after PhD, the postdoc, because I, can, I noticed that quite a lot of them do consultancies. Uh, I think it was about 50% uh, and work on NGO and so on and so forth. So my, my question to you is, that is, is really how we can sort of encourage some of them interested in research to pursue an academic research. Because at the moment I, I see there's private firm, uh, development agency. I don't know how many of them have chosen the academic career, but I think we could we could try to. I mean, not all of them would be able to do that, but at least a few have in mind that a few may actually pursue an academic career. Thank you. Yes. Bro. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy also to know that. Uh, we want to be part of uh, the curricular development uh, for these schools and also for the implementation because uh, we need to develop and also to implement it. I think that uh, if you can see all of those people who uh, did a presentation since uh, the day before yesterday, it's a kind of lecture also. You can choose, uh, <laughs> we have also a map of uh, a lecturer who can be for these uh, schools because we have a, a broad, a large, we, are, we have found a large people working in the diverse uh, uh, specialization. And coming to the uh, question, I think that uh, Waskal starts with six PhD schools and four master schools. And after, uh, after uh, three batches where uh, uh, master and PhD schools uh, uh, graduate student, we realized that it would be easier for a lot of people or a lot of master uh, students after the graduation went to do PhD. So they said that we can keep the master schools in the lead institution where, where those master schools have been developed, but we need also to get more schools in PhD. That's why for a new batch, starting by this year, we have 10 schools doing PhD. 
since uh, after that, before that, for example, in Gambia, the school was a master school, but the new batch is a PhD school. I think that most of the students, it depends on uh, the graduate people also. Some now we need, we don't need to have everybody coming to academics also, because it's better, it's better we are talking about uh, developing technology, we are talking about dissemination of research, we are talking also about how we can use some people to, um, to be a kind of negotiator or to do with our government. This is why uh, maybe we can see uh, that, but I think 51 is, is, is still good for academics. And the rest of the student going to other field of specialization, it depends also of, of it depends of uh, each graduate uh, student. Because when they came, some people, even if uh, they got the PhD, they can say, no, I don't want to work with a uh, uh, university. I don't want to work with uh, this institution. We have, for example, one student working for Islamic Bank. This is also very important. We are talking about uh, insurance in climate change. Having this, those kind of students working with Islamic Bank is very interesting for Pascal and very interesting for uh, the world also. That's why I can say that uh, good. We want uh, more, more graduates coming for academics, but not doing strictly academic, but can work with academic and also work for, for research. But if you are working with research, we can also get opportunity to work with extension services to disseminate what we got through our research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have two more questions? I know you want. You have a question, please. So, um, thank you very much, and thanks for your presentation. My name is Martin Antonio from the Medical Research Council in the Gambia Alliance of Hawaii Tropical Medicine. My question is about sustainability. I got the impression that WASCAL is funded by the German government. And I wanted to ask uh, what are the contribution from individual countries within West Africa, as well as WAHO, uh, ECOWAS, as well as EU, what is our contribution? Because uh, as we've all heard today, Boundary Health is a long-term project. It's not, yeah. it's not something that uh, should end in a few years time. We really want to have a long-term view about us. So I just wanted to know how much we contribute um, to that effort. Thank you so much. Uh, this is very important. It's a key, and it's a key question because of sustainability. Is, uh, a, when we sleep, we wake up sustainability. It's very important. And Wascal is thinking about that also because uh, as long as the project will be one day the founder we said okay i can stop here because i want to explore other opportunities i want also to help other people that why rascal before uh, was based in countries and each countries we have a lead institution that means it's uh, in the institution but it's not for this institution and after the institution we we have also established this graduate school and give to those school opportunity to have a building, having a building where we can go easily and where we can sit to work is a, a first uh, step for sustainability because we don't need to rush uh, somewhere, somewhere to, to, to do the courses. And also, Pascal uh, have uh, a plan for sustainability. This plan will go uh, started by country contribution because each country need to contribute. German people ask our countries to contribute with uh, uh, say 30,000 euro per year. It's not too much, but it's uh, up to now, they spend 60 million euro in capacity building in Africa, in West Africa. And the West African country has uh, produced or uh, provide and 0 0.7 mil, uh, uh, 600,000 euro. It's, you see, it's very small. But we need to sensitize more our institution. For each institution, for example, want to ask 
the leader to create a kind of budget line. For example, in the Gambia, if the university create, create, uh, develop a budget line for the, the school, it, it, it start by small money or small things to give to school. And after, the director also can if work with uh, the headquarters to see how to share. Because Rascal has a curricular to share with all of the institutions who are coming to develop knowledge in the field of climate change. And we have some partners who will come on board. We have, for example, uh, I can say that uh, in Africa we have PASET. PASET is a big institution in Africa. The aim of PASET is to train 10,000 PSU students in the next 10 coming years. This is an opportunity. We are going to approach PASET to say that we have curricula and PASET is an initiative of each African country starting by Senegal, Ethiopia and uh, Rwanda. And uh, through this initiative, every country of Africa should give 2 million euros. For now, only three countries give this money. For example, uh, Rwanda give uh, 2 million, Kenya give 2 million, Cote d'Ivoire give 1 million, and uh, we see the three countries. We have also some partners, and PASET start already implementation in Africa, in all of Africa. It's, it doesn't mean uh, uh, if uh, Burkina Faso give nothing, we are, we are not going to take students from Burkina Faso. No. We start like this. For Korean give uh, 50 million euro to PASET. They have a lot of money coming in this institution to train 10,000 million, uh, 10,000 uh, graduate in the 10 coming years. So this is where also Pascal can explore to give, to share his curricula, to give his curricula and to have a scholar coming from uh, a lot of countries. You can also uh, share, a, you can also raise funds by developing a project also. We have a lot of uh, way where we can have those sustainability. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, if you need further information, get, get hold of uh, Professor Kone. Yeah, one last question, Pat. Yeah, well, I just uh, want to endorse what the others have said. A wonderful presentation, and also to endorse the support they're giving to this kind of work. I just wanted to ask you, though, whether you considered developing distance learning. So, in London School, we have very major master's programs by distance learning, which have been enabling people who can't necessarily travel to London to participate uh, in studies. We have about 3,000 students studying by distance learning all over the world. And we're planning to develop this uh, master's in planetary health, including a major component of climate change. We haven't worked out the details yet, but I think it would make uh, an ideal project to you know, collaborate with you. And when I go back, I'll obviously discuss that with colleagues and with Bolton and Martin and so on. But just, my question really is about, have you thought about exploring the potential of distance learning and blended learning, where you combine face-to-face -face and, and distance learning together in a flexible kind of way? Come again. Distance learning. So distance learning is when you don't, uh, you can do it by e-learning, by yeah, 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 yeah. Um, or even by by written materials. But in these in these yeah. days, it's more yeah. using uh, web-based resources and virtual interaction. So we have yeah, virtual yeah. study groups and so on. No problem. That's why we have only. I said that Rascal is not only based on uh, graduate school. We have all, also, even if in the graduate school. We have uh, a kind of way to train using e-learning, you know, using some facility. I have been a director in Cote d'Ivoire. Sometimes when a lecturer cannot be able to come, so we organize a video conference, we can give a talk, and after we organize a, a, a kind of uh, uh, exam for a student. And also uh, one of sustainability is what? We are going to get accreditation for all of the schools. Because this is also a, 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 a kind of value we want to add to our schools. For example, in Cote d'Ivoire, we already got this accreditation. We are going to get it for all of the schools, and so those schools will be more visible and also will share more, uh, we, we share the best quality of uh, training. Okay, well, thank you very much. Not a plus. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Now we have the last presenter before tea break. And, um
The title of the presentation is IFMSA 2020 Vision. I hope that is not the Gambia 2020 Vision, right? Let's say the climate change in the medical curriculum. We have Allah Dafalal. Is that correct pronunciation? Oh, somebody else is doing it? Okay. Good. Thank you. My name is Alistair. Thank you so much for um, the presentation that we just had. I'm coming from the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, IFMSA, and I'm here to present our IFMSA vision on climate change in the medical curriculum. Now just a brief background that I can give you on what we're doing as IFMSA. We are the International Federation of Medical Students, and we have a membership and a representation from um, 136 country, 126 countries, and we are uh, composed of 1.3 million medical students. We have been working since 1951, together with the WHO, United Nations, and Wonka, and we have six thematic areas which include public health and medical education. We basically are banded together envisioning a healthier and better world. We have a composition that is stemming from international to regional level. We have five regions, which is Africa, the Asia Pacific, Eastern Mediterranean, um, uh, Europe, and Europe and um, the Americas. And we also have a national and local level, and we work majority, in majority under the mantra, um, think local, think global and act local. So what I'm here to basically talk about is climate change and health. There's an increasingly unignorable intersection that is there um, between climate change and health, and we believe that climate change is a public health emergency and should be treated like one. So what we have done in IFMSA as part of our IFMSA vision for 2020 is that one of our global priorities is climate change and health, which is focused on advocacy and capacity building. Our four main goals being the inclusion of climate change and health in education, the inclusion of climate change and health in decision making, international um, and in international climate negotiations, and the inclusion of climate change and health in, in terms of sustainability within our very own meetings. We want to walk the talk. So this vision was adopted in 2018 at the August meeting, the General Assembly that we had by 126 countries in Montreal, Canada, which was set to bridge the gap between climate and health and within the medical curriculum so that we can address the ever um, interlinking um, departments that are there. The two main objectives of this are we need to include an element of climate health in the um, curriculum of every medical school in the world. Secondly, we need to have an integrated climate health approach in all aspects in medical school life, including research, advocacy, training, and university healthcare systems. So what we have done so far is we've set up a training manual alongside the WHO, which was set on climate and health, and we've had training workshops in Slovenia, um, training workshops in Taiwan, and we're set to have another training workshop in, in Rwanda in this, uh, this year. So we've had three workshops based on this manual, and it's already in use and can be replicated. Secondly, we have also worked within our own structure to have recommendations for more sustainable meetings because we have general assemblies where by over a thousand medical students meet twice a year and we have used this and integrated this in the choices we make concerning our accommodation, our venues, our transport and every single material that we use because we are aiming to cut down the carbon footprint and also take leadership in, in mapping out a sustainable future for ourselves. The third thing that we've managed to do is we've managed to establish a public health um, in the medical curriculum toolkit that can be used by students um, in advocating for more public health exposure in medical schools at an earlier stage, which has currently been reviewed by the World Fellowship, uh, the World Federation of Public Health Associations, and is being updated. And this is a f small resource that can be used by everyone, which is 15 pages long and can be used in advocacy on the matter. So we also did what I'm mainly presenting on today. We also did a survey across the medical schools world over and across our members who are in 26 countries, in 126 countries. 
the four questions that we developed alongside with the climate change agencies of the world is that one what are the three health priorities in your country two how are medical schools um, how many medical schools are there in your country? The third question was, in how many medical schools is there climate change in the medical education? Four, in how many medical schools is there an informal or student-led education on climate change in the past? And the results that we found were quite astound astounding in our view. The first thing is, this survey was filled by 118 countries. And in these 118 countries, the report was that in only 15.3 um, countries in the world um, do we have public health listed as a priority, do we have climate change listed as a public health priority? Um, the second result that we found is that yet we have 15.3 recognizing it as a priority. 60.1 of the medical students associations in the world and the medical sc schools in the world have a student-led educational activity that is running currently on climate change. Conversely, it was also reported that only 30.5% of, uh, of the medical schools have a climate change curriculum in one way or the other, but only 15.9% of all of the medical schools in the world have a climate change integrated into their major curriculum. So this is astounding in that it shows that, first of all, the students and the young people do care about uh, climate change and are trying their best to implement it into their education and into the medical curriculum but conversely the governments and the uh, the governments and the medical schools do not prioritize that as of yet so we've had a few successes in advocating for this. For starters, we've had the situation of climate change um, in Canada, where one of our members has managed to um, work on the national curriculum evaluation in Canada, whereby schools were received a numerical score, which, kind, which weighed on the extent to which um, climate change has been integrated into their medical curricula. And the grades were coming from 10 to 30, and then were graded from A to F. The scores were, 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 were analyzed in the 17 medical schools within Canada, and it was realized that 19 of the, it was realized that um, 19 of the, 19 of the, Sorry, the average score was actually 19 across the board, but five schools had grades A and B, and three schools had very low grades, which were F, meaning that there was a very diverse um, cross-section of how medical education was, uh, was uh, integrated into their curriculum. And this was positive in that it stimulated action towards which climate change started getting included into the Canadian med medical education system, which is something that can be replicated world over, including Africa which has no medical school at all, which has climate change integrated into the medical school um, system. We are speaking of this because as future and current health practitioners, our responsibility is not only to our patients, but to the communities from which they come from. And we do know that climate change is a public health emergency, and we, have to, we can never have a future, we can never have a discussion about sustainability and the future without the youth on the table and without equipping medical students and health practitioners with the adequate competencies to address the needs of climate health. So what we're currently working on going forward is that we're working on a climate and health manual that's updated. We're working on the pu public health medical curriculum that we have uh, spoken of before, but we're also working on a climate change core competencies for medical education framework. So this is set to be a template kind of curriculum which medical schools can adopt easily, and we're hoping that we can get collaboration from academics and ad administrators so that this, this could enable easy absorption of climate change into the medical curricula of the world. So, this is basically what we have been doing, and this is the map that we have. And the final thing that we envision, of do, we envision doing is that we want to set up a climate health map of the world over, since we have so much data from medical students who are all over the world, so that we can track how much work is being done in individual countries concerning climate change and health and the intersection thereof. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was excellent and exciting. And uh, it shows that the medical field now, you're part of the bandwagon on climate change. It's everybody's business. 
So any question? Can we have two questions? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy because, for, for, as I've seen it, climate change seems to be... Oh, sorry. My name is Brahma Kone from the University of Korogo in Northern Cote d'Ivoire and also at the Ministry of Health and Education in Cote d'Ivoire. So I saw it as an opportunity to bring environmental concerns in the training of medical doctors. And this opportunity for me should not only focus on climate change, but climate change should be an opportunity to really emphasize on whole ecosystemic concerns for health. I've always been discussing with doctor when I'm going there with my child. As soon as you start saying what your child have, you start prescribing drugs. And my question is always, please doctor, what should I avoid at home to not come back after? And this is always a problem for me when I'm going there. So for me, this is really an opportunity. I really encourage you. But I think we should not focus only on climate change, but all environmental concerns and ecosystemic approach to health can be a very good point to look at. Thank you so much. Thank you for that observation and comment. Any, any more questions? Yes. Please. My name is Ola Bodiekeri. I'm from the Lagos State University College of Medicine, Nigeria. And um, it's more like a contribution. Um, I just graduated from medical school. And um, it's so funny that I'm interested in planetary health, but um, the medical curriculum, it's so funny. It's so funny that planetary health is not included. And um, it's also so funny that um, our lecturers, who uh, top guys in public health do not understand the concept of climate change. Um, we, we, we do classes around environmental health, we do classes around um, climate, they teach us global warming and the likes, but it's funny that uh, we use the same slides all the time. At all, every year we use the same slides because we've, we've come to understand that they do not really understand the concept. Thank you very much, IFMSA, for this. All right. Um, can, just you know, maybe, can you comment on that? Yes. That um, on both comments, I think one of the main thing is that the main reasons why we're focused on climate change, and of note, I'll use the example in Australia currently with the bushfires. There are extreme circumstances that are being continually exposed, that the world is being continually exposed to, which have health consequences of a diverse nature, and using climate change as a pivotal step through which we could address how inclu inclusive health can be health can be um, addressed as is quite important because there are extreme weather events, there are extreme public health concerns, and the general disease demographic is changing simply because of public health. And the equipment of such competences should be something of priority within our medical schools and something of priority within the training of future healthcare professionals. So I really do think those are amazing contributions, and we are hoping that we can actually work further to do that and implement that. Thank you. Yeah, and also I want to add to that, uh, lecturers or many lecturers may be able to understand climate change. For example, my office at the University of Gambia, that's one of our plans in 2020, to have all lecturers within the University of Gambia to attend if it's going to be a three-day crash course on climate change so that everybody has an understanding of what climate change is and how you can incorporate it in your curriculum. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, we have one question. Sorry. What? Well, last question. Is there a comment or a question? Yeah, there's a question and a comment. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to also take this opportunity to thank the last uh, presenter um, on WASCAL program. I, I happen to be one of the supervisors of a student who actually did climate change and education. And actually, we are benefiting from his work um, as we are integrating climate change um, uh, in our school curriculum. So I want to give that special thank to WASCAL for that. Um, on the climate change and uh, curriculum in medical, uh, in climate change in medical curriculum, um, I'm just wondering how 
Because like, these are two broad things. Mm. And curriculum planners are always worried uh, in between the, you know, what is to be covered and the time. So when you say climate change in medical curriculum, is it uh, knowing that climate change is also a very huge subject? Mm -hmm. Do you mean um, climate change awareness of the students or climate change as it applies to the work of a doctor? For example, how do you, how do you dispose? I mean, clinical ways. These are, you know, things uh, of uh, interest to medical students. So this, uh, this is my puzzle. Do you mean climate change awareness of the students as it is? Or do you want to, is it climate change as it applies to the work of a medical plan? All right. Thank you so much, sir. I think the first thing, there are three components that we will be working on if we are going to include this. The first one being the equipping of an understanding, a scientific understanding and a socio-economic understanding to medical students on the subject. The second thing is the equipping of competencies to deal with diseases um, that are affecting the community that are based on cli uh, climate change. And the fourth one is to equip them with the adequate research skills and the academic skills so that they can serve their communities relevantly and the world relevantly soon after they graduate and they, can, and they are released into, into the community. So this is what we're basing on and these are the competencies that we want. So currently we're actually working on the core competency framework and we, we will be establishing that very soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Well, round of applause. Okay, Dembo, you have the floor of uh, logistics, please. Sorry, everybody. Um, today is uh, Friday. So at 2 o'clock, I know a lot of us will want to go for Friday prayer. So we're trying to maximize on our time as much as possible. So we'll give the shortest possible tea break. Somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes, please. Let's try to come back here, and then we'll do the rest of the session. All right, thank you.